Morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 29th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2014? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices uh, completely as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent? No apologies have been received. Item 1. I'm inviting the Committee to agree to consider our approach to the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill and to the Draft Public Services Reform Inspection and Monitoring of Prisons Scotland Order 2014 under items 3 and 4 in private. Are you agreed? Thank you very much. Item 2, our draft budget scrutiny. Um, this is a further evidence session, and this is the first day of scrutiny of the Court's budget. We'll hear from three panels of witnesses, and I welcome to the meeting our first panel, Andrew Alexander, Head of Access to Justice Law Society of Scotland, and Alan McCloskey, Director of Operations, Victim Support Scotland. And we have your written submissions, to which I thank you. And I will go straight to questions from members, and in case you've not given evidence here before, if you just indicate to me um, that you wish to answer a question or a question has been directed at you specifically, your light will automatically come on, um, as mine has here, and that tell you that you're, you're live, and be careful what you say. Um, questions? Are we awake? Questions? Ah, John, you are. John. Thank you, Good morning, panel. Panel, uh, the additional remote facilities for vulnerable witnesses, are you able to comment on the st stage where they are? Has sufficient resource been put to that from the budget? Mr. McCloskey. Thank you. Um, our experience thus far of some of the remote sites has been, I think it's fair to say, disappointing in terms of the technology. I think the principle of having remote sites is sound. Uh, it is right and proper that vulnerable witnesses have the opportunity to give their evidence perhaps <coughs> from a, remo a remote site facility, particularly for children, particularly for children. Um, but often it's the case that the, the links go down and the technology is, is ineffective. So that's our experience. And a lot of court time can be, can be lost in actually uh, getting the links back working again and the operation of it. So it sounds good and in principle we absolutely support it, but we would like to see better technology in place rather than what we currently have, which is at best sometimes hit and miss. And give, sorry, Mr. Alexander, but given the connection with the provision of these facilities and court closures, yeah. is is this a, a run out of previous um, models which had these difficulties? Is it to do with the infrastructure? The, I mean, I'm not technical, but is it to do with the broadband or absence thereof or inefficiency thereof? Well, I, I think the court closures are perhaps put more pressure on the the use of remote sites, but I think the issues in terms of remote sites and the technology has been an issue for a number of years. It's not a recent uh, issue and we have raised that with Scottish courts on a number of occasions about the fact that the infrastructure needs to be better and like you I'm, I'm not technically minded to know um, but I know there are resourcing issues perhaps from um, a branch of Scottish courts ESDU who actually operate and are in charge of making Sorry, you ESDU, ESDU. Um, I think it's the electronic it doesn't matter. Department. We've got the acronym and we ESD, can put it to them. Yeah. Yes, um, yes. And they're responsible for making sure that the arrangements are in place for the operation, the timely operation of the remote sites and the TV links. And that has been a, an issue for a number of years. So it's nothing new in our to your question. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr Alexander. Uh, thank you very much and thank you very much for inviting us to uh, give oral evidence today. Uh, just to agree with Alan, we've heard similar feedback from our members uh, and also we agree with the broad uh, principle that uh, the use of these remote sites is, uh, can be very effective. Um, we believe that particularly with court closures uh, having taken place and, and continuing to take place until next year that it's important that these facilities exist and also with the uh, concentration with the introduction of summary sheriffs of sheriff and jury work into uh, 16 locations out of the remaining estate, around 50%, uh, we think that uh, you know, so it will be important to uh, utilise this technology effectively. And do you feel there's sufficient resource in the budget directed to that, the provision of this equipment? Um, we have questioned uh, overall with the uh, draft budget um, around the Justice Digital Strategy um, and uh, whether there are additional resources earmarked for uh, video conferencing and for other uses of technology, or whether this is intended to come out of existing budgets, uh, we're very keen to see this technology in place, being used effectively, uh, and ensuring effective uh, court proceedings. Um, so uh, we're certainly keeping a weather eye on this. Keith. Yeah. 
Um, and maybe just to add, <coughs> add to that, the, we did note that the Scottish Court Service budget has a, an increase in 15, 16 or 4 million. And I if I remember from the notes correctly, they've allocated 1.9 million to ICT, which I think is welcome. But we would be very interested to know when their time scale and timetable for actually implementing that will actually be. So it sounds very good to actually say they've allocated the money. But in relation to, as I said, some of the earlier issues about remote sites, if there's going to be that provision, then we would certainly like to see that timetable uh, made public. Okay, thank you both very much. Thank you. As a, as a matter of um, supplementary to Mr Alexander, would there be savings, I know legal aid, there will be issues about legal aid, would there be savings to the legal aid budget if we used uh, remote accessing more frequently? Um, certainly. The um, uh, Scottish Government's white paper, A Sustainable Future for Legal Aid, uh, published in 2011, thought that video conferencing overall could save around £1.5 million out of the uh, legal aid budget. Um, this, uh, you know, one of the principal ways in which this would save money uh, is through cutting down travel time to prisons to allow solicitors to have consultations um, with their clients remotely um, while um, held at prison. Um, there has been a pilot of this. It's been broadly successful. There have been some technical issues around um, some firms' firewalls and the like, um, but that, um, that pilot will be extended um, early next year, um, and we think that it's an effective way that... Um, client consultations can take place. Um, it has the capacity to save. It also has the capacity to, to, to deal with things efficiently. Um, obviously, um, there will be questions about uh, bandwidth overall in that we can't have um, you know, sort of too many connections taking place to, to prisons at the same time. And we would want to ensure that there still exist payment structures under legal aid um, to allow face-to-face uh, -face attendances at a prison, particularly for vulnerable accused. Um, but in principle, we think that increased use of video conferencing is a very good idea. Where was the pilot? So, forgive me, where was the pilot? Um, the pilot was uh, taking place with a, uh, a limited number of firms and across uh, a number of uh, prisons, um, uh, including uh, Barlini, uh, Edinburgh and others. Thank you very much. Um, Alison, followed by Margaret, followed by Christian. Alison. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, turning to the court reform agenda, um, obviously the, the expectation was that this would result in more effective and efficient courts. Do you think that's the case, and do you have any emerging concerns about how court reform is currently progressing? I think what we're seeing is, with the court closures and the court reforms in general, there are more people coming into courts. That, that is fact. There is pressure on some of the existing courts in terms, literally, of uh, the availability of rooms in courts for all the things that need to happen in a court. There's JP courts, the sheriff business, the civil business, and there are more and more people turning up in courts. That is a fact. From our perspective, one of the issues that, or our concerns is around uh, the when victims and witnesses turn up, the separate facilities that may or may not be in place, um, and also the fact that for many uh, accused people, the only space that they can actually meet with their lawyers tends to be in the public areas, the atrium in Aberdeen, for example. Victims and witnesses will come into contact with the accused and their supporters. Some of the court locations and also the, the layout of courts, because they're historical buildings, makes it perhaps challenging to just suddenly say we need a new court in place. But where people are coming into contact victims and witnesses with the accused and their supporters can, can be very intimidating, either at the court entrance or in and around the public areas of the courts, because there aren't necessarily uh, designated areas uh, for uh, victims, accused, uh, and, and actual separation of that. That, that, that is a particular issue, um, and that perhaps causes issues about victims and witnesses maybe not turning up at court, um, and obviously the the administration of justice then perhaps isn't as, as effective as it should be. So there is a concern um, about that. But you would agree that's not new. I mean, that, even when I was in new. practice, yeah. it, 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 was, it was a nightmare in certain very old courts, mm -hmm. I think. It's not, it's not new, but is it more no. acute now? It's more acute saying. because yeah, a number I'm of the courts are I'm happy to closing. develop that. It's just to make plain that I know that's from my own experience, I was quite surprised in certain old courts that <laughs> you were all stuck together in one room, quite difficult circumstances. Yeah. And it's not a good thing, I agree. No, no, Alex. it's not a good thing. And if there's further pressure and this is mm -hmm. becoming a more yeah. pressing problem, then yeah. would you support the suggestion that the court service needs to go back through an iterative process about the reforms to, to, to kind of 
pick up on these pressure points and to start to address them. Some mileage in that, and also yeah. we've, we've worked with Scottish courts. We did a went on a tour with them last year in some of the bigger courts, and actually walked them through uh, the victim and witness journey of actually coming into a yeah. court, the experience of that, and things like simple things that don't necessarily cost money, adequate signage that points people in the right direction, having a desk that's operated yeah. uh, and that tells people where they go, and that customer experience doesn't necessarily cost money but it's just a good thing and that, that encourages people to come back and say well actually that was that, that was okay far less the court experience but actually coming into court can be far more welcoming and having water provision some of the courts don't have water so we took the, the court staff around them and said these are the facilities that people have to be in where they don't get a, a glass of water or in a waiting room where you're there for maybe six seven hours and there's no tv or there's there's a lack of reader material or a lack of facilities for, for kids that come into court. There's some very basic things that don't, they just need a bit of imagination. Um, so we, we continue to work with Scottish Court Service to help identify where some of those areas are. And do you feel that, if I might, convener, do you feel that the correct um, formal channels for, for that sort of improvement to be fed into the court service, or does it depend on you just having that informal? Link with them. We have formal channels and links yeah. with the Scottish Court yeah. Service, and because we've identified it, in fairness, they've, they've recognised that uh, they agreed to do a, a tour of the eight or nine uh, largest courts with us last year, and I think we will continue to re re revisit that because it was a very practical uh, way of demonstrating the things and the experiences that victims and witnesses tell us on a regular basis. And do you then, I mean, after you visit mm. and after you walk through, um, have you seen improvements in that area? Have you been advised that improvements have been made? Yes, we, yes. we, we have seen that. Yes. And again, it's, okay. it's, so, it's, so it's making a difference. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, and certainly we're monitoring the situation around uh, court reform at the moment. Uh, we've obviously had the first two tranches of sheriff courts uh, close uh, and are... Um, you know, we'll see the third taking place early next year. Um, we've also seen uh, the Courts Reform Act uh, pass, uh, and we'll be looking at a, a system of uh, summary sheriffs being introduced across uh, the courts of Scotland and the introduction of a specialist personal injury court. Um, it's uh, with the introduction of summary sheriffs, it's something that's taking place over you know, so possibly a decade. Um, so it won't be a big bang. Uh, there will be uh, the opportunity to snag issues as they crop up. Um, and, um, and we've already seen that there have been some uh, concerns around the way in which uh, uh, court business is being dealt with. Uh, we um, have uh, you know, sort of, uh, obviously kind of noted Sheriff Liddell's concerns around uh, uh, criminal uh, cases in Edinburgh. Um, we've had uh, reports of uh, commissary delays uh, taking place across uh, certain courts. Um, and uh, also note from uh, Scottish Women's Aid's evidence uh, the increasing time that it's taking for summary cases to be uh, 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 concluded. Um, now, it may just be that, uh, you know, sort of with courts, that it's um, a complex system, you know, sort of uh, having gone through one set of transitions and on the cusp of another, uh, rather than any kind of fundamental issues around resourcing. Um, but, uh, and it may also be that, you know, sort of, uh, some of these issues can be resolved, you know, sort of through discussions uh, between court users, the court service and others, um, but it's certainly an issue that we're monitoring. Thank you, Margaret, followed by Christian, followed by Sandra, followed by John Pentland. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. You've touched a little bit on some of the legislation that's, that's been introduced, whether it's court reform or the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2004. In general, this legislation and the, um, the two I've mentioned in particular, do you think there's a need for additional resources to adequately meet the kind of demands that this legislation is putting on the court services at um, every single level, whether it's defence, whether it's estate, whether it's kind of and procurator fiscal service? Um, I certainly think that uh, there are areas around the court reform bill that we had highlighted uh, in our evidence previously. Um, uh, one of the areas in particular was around judicial training in that uh, we will be developing a, a summary sheriff as a role and specialist sheriff as a role. And we thought that uh, the a provision that was provided for uh, training of the judiciary uh, might not be sufficient to allow these roles to flourish. Um, that was certainly a concern. Uh, around the Victims and Witnesses Bill, um, you know, so we had looked at some of the costs around legal aid, um, and um, you know, I think we're 
happy that, uh, that those costs you know, have been adequately expressed and are being met. Could I just touch on legal aid? I, I know in the legal aid reform, the Scottish Civil Justice Council and Criminal Legal Assistance Scotland Bill Act 2003 seemed to, to raise quite a lot of concerns from the Law Society in particular, I think, uh, in connection with the contributions from clients and the Law Society's uh, role in having to collect that. How's that panning out? Is that having uh, the impact that uh, they feared might um, occur in terms of solicitors not carrying out pre-trial um, preparation, solicitors withdrawing uh, from representing clients, accused people representing themselves, causing delays, any of that? Um, we thought that, uh, that that would be a particular concern. Um, we believed in the overall principle that the government set out, which is that uh, those who can afford to pay towards the cost of their defence should do so. Um, we thought that the most practical way for these contributions to be collected, um, as with civil legal aid currently, was for the legal aid board uh, to collect contributions from clients, uh, rather than from individual arrangements being made with individual solicitors across the country. Um, the, um, the legislation was, was passed. Um, it still remains to be implemented. Um, obviously, you know, so our concerns remain as to you know, so what should take place if uh, a client... Uh, doesn't pay the contribution, which you know, so it has been determined that they can afford to do, um, uh, and um, we will see, um, you know, so sort of what plans the government has for contributions overall when it uh, publishes its refreshed legal aid strategy, um, which we're anticipating this autumn, uh, and uh, we've also uh, published our own discussion paper around legal aid reform uh, to uh, start a debate about uh, what a sustainable future for legal aid might look like. All right. So that's um, still to be implemented, and, and that's a potential um, a potential concern in, in the pipeline. Uh, I think that there are certainly concerns uh, there around um, you know, overall rates of collection and what to do with with clients who um, uh, don't or aren't able to pay those contributions. Right. Uh, so um, yeah, that remains an active concern. You mentioned us. some delays. What, what's causing this? Where's this coming from? What, what isn't working properly? I think you mentioned Sheriff Little talking about the lease in um, your experience. I mean, we're obviously seeing you know, sort of a number of uh, issues being raised around uh, the way in which kind of business is scheduled at courts overall. Um, it, it may simply be that, uh, that this is, uh, these are just uh, teething problems in a complex system. Uh, obviously, the, the Sheriff Courts... Um, in the Edinburgh area, where you know, sort of Sheriff Little's comments related to, uh, those are uh, scheduled for close, closure next uh, year. So uh, court closures uh, don't appear to have had an impact there. Um, and uh, it is something that we're monitoring. And uh, as I'd mentioned, as we'll be int introducing summary sheriffs uh, through the justice system over the course of a, a, a significant period, um, it will allow for um, any issues, hopefully, to be uh, resolved as uh, over time. Are you personally in the courts on a day-to-day -day basis or at all? Uh, no, no, I, I work at the, the Law Society. Uh -huh. I, and do you reflect the views of your members then with the comments you've made? Uh, yes, yes I do. Okay. Oh, you said of access to justice, I certainly hope so. <laughs> oh, you've got the wrong title. Uh, yes, Margaret. Um, your question at the start was around the legislation coming in and, and impact on victims and witnesses and we recognize there is a need uh, 2014 to balance budgets for agencies and organizations but also to deliver services um, and there is a requirement to have effective and efficient justice and that's what we would be very keen to make sure is is maintained and, and actually improved um, we would have concerns if any reduction in justice budget or the allocation of any of the agencies um, has a negative impact on the services to victims and witnesses, um, particularly in light of the, the Victims and Witnesses Bill and, and other legislation, because we know that victims and witnesses need to have uh, confidence in the system and it needs to be effective. It needs to meet their needs um, and they need to have a positive experience of the justice system. That, that has to be crucial um, moving forward both today and, and tomorrow. And as uh, this, this, this committee is well aware of, some of the experiences that victims and witnesses have had and their 
in a negative way of having to repeat their story so many times has been articulated. Except, Mr McCloskey, that we, we're very well aware of yeah. all that, having, so. not, having you know, heard, apart from having done the Victors and Witnesses Bill, also just our own experience, we're well aware, and that the committee would very much support, you know, as much support can be given to victims and witnesses in court, and before that, yeah, in the early stages when interviewed by the police and so on. Um, Margaret, do you want to... Thank you. Um, Christian, followed by Sandra, followed by John Pentland. And Good morning. By uh, thank you very much. And, you know, some of the uh, answers have been given already. Uh, sorry about my voice. I've got a little bit of a cold. Uh, uh, you said... I still have difficulties. Sometimes <laughs> understanding you, Monsieur Rallam, <laughs> with or without a cold. <laughs> and, and it doesn't help with the, with the cold. <laughs> no, uh, no. <laughs> you talked about, uh, Mr Alexander, you talked about some teething problems. And you said that uh, there will be some concern how the court reforms and court closures happen. But uh, do you think it will result at mid, uh, medium term and a long term and a more effective and efficient court system? And do you think uh, that uh, what impact it will have uh, on the budget? Do you think do you think there is a possibility that this the, the savings will be uh, will really happen in real terms? Um, obviously the. The intention of the, the court reform uh, bill um, and now act uh, was to introduce a, a hub and spoke model um, for the courts with summary sheriffs dealing with uh, a range of uh, uh, summary cause matters in civil, uh, the uh, uh, small claims actions, uh, summary crime and, and other areas uh, with specialist sheriffs dealing with um, ordinary cause for civil um, and uh, sheriff and jury cases in, in criminal. Um, the idea being to, uh, to concentrate uh, the higher value civil cases and the more complex uh, criminal cases um, in these 16 sheriff and jury hubs and then uh, consequently to take the capital resource to make sure that there were facilities there that supported this more complex generally business. Um, we support the, the broad principle of that. Um, I think the concerns that we had around access to justice were... Uh, around the small number of cases that would uh, take place which would require uh, significant amounts of travel. So uh, taking a, a sheriff and jury case where um, uh, accused and witnesses uh, were based in WIC, um, customarily you know, sort of under the hub-and-spoke model that the court service uh, have suggested this would be heard in Inverness. Um, and the travel distances uh, are uh, very significant with public transport or indeed uh, a car. Uh, can be about a nine-hour round trip. We just didn't think that that was particularly practical. It uh, might open uh, witnesses uh, uh, or the victim uh, to uh, intimidation, you know, sort of taking the same transport as other parties. Um, uh, and um, and we thought that uh, that it might not, uh, although it may um, allow the court service to consolidate, uh, it may create uh, costs for uh, the various other parties to the case. Um, so, uh, on that basis, we thought that, uh, that there were significant concerns around access to justice. We understand that there may remain some flexibility to have cases heard locally, uh, where otherwise they would be concentrated into these uh, uh, 16 hubs. Um, and, um, and we think that, in principle, trying to concentrate resources uh, into these uh, areas on that model is a sensible idea. Um, as we suggested in our um, written evidence to the committee, uh, there remains a significant maintenance backlog across the court estate, um, and uh, we believe that uh, trying to uh, prioritise particular areas to make sure that they're as uh, fit for purposes for complex business as possible um, is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, Sandra, followed by John Penn, and followed by Roderick. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and, and good morning. I'm pleased to see that uh, I think both of the witnesses have mentioned the support broadly, you know, the changes in the 16 hubs, and uh, obviously there's issues there with ICT and uh, video links, so it's something that we obviously will be looking at also. I just wanted to touch on, on a couple of things in regards to uh, victim and witnesses. Uh, certainly my experience of going round the, the various courts uh, the job they do, uh, I commend them. I think they've done a fantastic job. Uh, I just wanted to touch on the part where we were talking about perhaps even the churn or victims and the accused meeting together. Uh, I certainly didn't see that in the courts that I visited, but they were bigger courts. So would you say it was more prevalent in the smaller courts? And obviously, 
I would go on to say that perhaps some of these courts weren't fit for purpose in, in the way that you would like to see them. Okay. Um, well, if I give you a couple of examples of courts, um, Aberdeen is one where it's quite a new court, but the atrium there is, is a choke point. In Hamilton Court, there's a choke point at the entrance. Uh, in Tain, although there's a separate victim and witness uh, area, they're next to each other. So this confrontation in and around the waiting areas and, and the, of the waiting rooms. Um, where else have I got? Um, Kilmarnock can be an issue. Um, and, and Livingston, there's inadequate signage, or has been in the past, and, and, and other areas. Dundee, there can be issues because of the, the nature of the court itself. So typically, when we're looking at t to develop new courts, and I, I do recognise uh, and welcome uh, the, the principle of new facilities, better facilities in the courts, I think it has to be, as, as Scottish courts have acknowledged, a collaborative approach so that all agencies work together to design properly what all the needs of all the court users is going to be. So we would fully support uh, the development of that. Um, I do know from experience last year uh, we were involved in the the, the the pilot in the borders of the the justice uh, the justice hub, and there were, we were, we were quite rightly asked to come to the table to give our views about what would work. And identifying a location was actually one of the biggest challenges that the Scottish Court Services had about where this hub would be based. Is it Gala Shields? Is it Peebles? Duns? Um, so there were some logistical challenges. So it sounds really good to have let's have a justice hub and people can come. But the, the transport difficulties can be really challenging, getting to wherever location you choose. So that all needs to be factored in, in terms of where the, the justice hubs are going to be. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be a wide public consultation um, to make sure that all the needs are taken into account of, in terms of identifying where the new facilities are going to be. And as you touched on, I think it's really, really important the, the information technology is there to supplement that. It's not just about the locations, it's also the, the back end of it where the remote sites and other facilities are going to be that's really crucial to making it much more modern, much more effective uh, and much more customer friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, could, uh, and, uh, you know, so if I broadly agree with that, there are you know, so if, uh, a number of courts because of the uh, age of the buildings, uh, you know, so for other factors uh, that ha don't currently have the facilities which um, you know, so if we would like to see, um, but you know, so if we understand that the court service is working on this, uh, there are you know, sort of uh, plans uh, as have been mentioned around uh, feasibility studies for justice centres, and the borders was one where uh, rather than considering a central hub on the Livingston model with uh, integrated services in the building, uh, that the current um, uh, configuration following court closures. Um, uh, of Selkirk and Jedburgh be retained. Um, and, and we do believe that uh, information technology um, you know, sort of may uh, alleviate some of the pressures around uh, physical resources at court buildings, but equally um, it's a human rights requirement that criminal hearings take place in public. Um, you know, it is important that uh, you know, sort of people are able to see and participate uh, in the justice system. Um, and uh, for all its benefits, uh, information uh, Technology may not be the answer in all situations. I mentioned earlier that uh, if it were, we could probably could have been replaced with video screens and been uh, patched in by video conference today instead. Could I follow I'm up? just very disappointed with the decision not to have one at Gala because you've mentioned transport links and I can't think of how easy it is to get from Peebles or other areas to Selkirk um, because the bus hub and the train station hub will all be in Gala, but I'm still fighting that one. But I just... <laughs> I, don't, I was interested yeah. you'd been there because mm -hmm. yeah. it was a mystery to me why that was rejected. Mm -hmm. But there you go. There you politics, go. dear boy, politics, probably. Can I follow up that you can chair? follow up. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, as you said yourself, Mr Alexander, it depends on individual cases and the video links in certain areas. Perhaps in Ghana or other way would be you know, an improvement in what they have at the moment. But I wanted to talk about the service and, and victims and witnesses and obviously accused... When I visited the courts and indeed was a witness, uh, and, 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 well, a called witness uh, in, in, a, in a particular case, the, the churn and the, the waiting around was mostly caused, and you mentioned the fact that all agencies should work together, was mostly caused at the last minute by lawyers advising their clients 
either, you know, to plead guilty or not guilty. Now, you mentioned all agencies must work together. There must be a role here for lawyers as well to fit in in this particular issue. It's an issue of mine that I've raised on a number of occasions, but that has been, in my experience and others' experience, where witnesses turn up, we have a very good service for the witness, victim witnesses. They talk to everyone, they explain what's going on. You could be there for hours, and then at the last minute, uh, the, the trial is, is abandoned. So surely lawyers must have, a, have an input as well. They must recognise that some of the churn, maybe most of the churn, I don't know, uh, they're all responsible. <laughs> Sandra, there's a whole story in there. So would you say that all agencies, and that includes lawyers as well, really have to, to play their part? Most certainly. I, I think that a, a collaborative approach to some of the challenges that, that there are in the justice system is ultimately the only way forward. Um, around summary justice reform, where we had looked to incentivise uh, early resolution of cases, uh, work which took place at the end of the kind of uh, noughties and at the start of this decade, uh, significant inroads were met, made rather, um, and, uh, and we believe that there's, there's further work that can be done there. We'd read uh, the uh, Audit Scotland report uh, on efficiencies in the criminal justice system in 2011 uh, with some interest. Uh, obviously, some churn is, is by intention. Um, for instance, uh, uh, at first hearing, there's the option to continue without plea rather than to enter a, a not guilty because it's not clear how the evidence has worked, uh, and then essentially to repeat the first stage rather than to proceed to an intermediate diet. Um, and that's actually proved uh, an effective measure. Um, but, um, you know, so if we are, um, uh, you know, sort of looking at uh, the issues around uh, early resolution, um, uh, certainly that's one of the uh, uh, themes in our current discussion paper around legal aid, um, which we've um, uh, circulated to our members uh, and to uh, organisations across the justice sector uh, to get their views. Um, and we do participate in a number of, uh, you know, sort of the projects that are working across the justice sector. Um, and, um, you know, sort of, uh, for instance, uh, you know, sort of discussing with Audit Scotland, um, you know, sort of around uh, their current work, uh, revising the 2011 uh, project that they completed uh, to see how things have progressed around efficiency in the criminal justice system. But certainly, you know, sort of, uh, we believe that there's, uh, you know, sort of uh, an active part that we can play, uh, experience that, that we have, uh, and, you know, we're very keen to work together with other agencies to do so. Uh, thank, thank you very much, and uh, look forward to the report coming forward again from Audit Scotland. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Chair. Would that include, uh, with regard to, um, you know, accelerating cases and being able to plead more appropriately at the first calling, that the Crown or the Procurator Fiscal Service has more time to show the defence than the nature of the the evidence they have in the complaint against the accused, because quite often one saw them in court just looking, you know, stream of defence lawyers leaning over the procurator fiscal shoulder to have a look and see what the paperwork was, what kind of evidence they had, and discussing there and then just before the court was called. Is there not, do we not need more time for that so that the, the Crown case can be, you know, before it comes into uh, the pleading diet? Um, or have things changed? Uh, uh, there are certainly improvements being made and, and significant um, inroads that have uh, uh, been made, for instance, by summary justice reform. Uh, there are you know, sort of, uh, clearly uh, ways in which um, uh, cases uh, are being dealt with differently now. For instance, one uh, key element is the fact that uh, significant numbers of people are now requesting uh, legal advice at a police station. So uh, solicitors are being involved at a very early stage in proceedings. And uh, as uh, you know, has been mentioned a number of times, uh, proceedings almost the, the trial almost starts at, at the police station. Uh, we have in excess of I think 70 people a day at the moment who are requesting advice, and uh, you know, solicitors providing that. So um, it uh, does give you an opportunity to um, you know, hear the the evidence, uh, uh, well, and, and be present for you know, police interviews. So, so uh, uh, it may be that that's um, you know, helping certainly on the defence side. I just wondered, you know, about being more informed before you put in a plea or continue. Sorry? Don't you? That's right. That's, yeah. that's, that's the technical term, yes. John Pentland, followed by Roderick. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Mr McCluskey, obviously victim support is dependent on its funding from other agencies. And uh, 
none more so than the SPA, and obviously the SPA are, are in the process of having to make some difficult decisions uh, to, to make efficiencies. Uh, what kind of area do you find that would be under pressure if, you know, some of these efficiencies or cuts were, were put down yourself? What areas would you perceive that you would have to cut? And probably just as a follow-up to that, what input do you have to the budget process with the SPA? Right. Can I just clarify? We we funded eighty percent of our monies comes from Scottish government, not not SPA at all. They don't fund us in any way, shape, or form. We get monies from some local, some local reading, authorities, and fun, we fundraise for our money because we're, we're a charity. Yeah. But it's I'm probably the, reading from your submission here that no, we work closely with the, with Police Scotland, but in terms of referrals, but we don't actually get any direct funding. I'm just reading from your, obviously, your submission here, and if there's a real term decrease to the SBA budget, we would welcome, you know, we would welcome further information from Peace Scotland as how they would intend to fulfil the financial commitment with relations to domestic violence, sexual crimes and human trafficking, etc., etc. In terms of how they deal with cases, but they don't, they don't fund us. So, sorry if that's, if that's confused you. Right. Okay. Don't, don't you want to keep? I'll let Roddy no, and then come no, back. No, no, to no, no, that, so, no. so you're totally funded by the, the Scottish government. About eighty percent of our funding is from Scottish comes from the Scottish government. Yeah. Right, okay then. That okay. Right, okay. Uh, Mr. Alexander, obviously you, you had mentioned that obviously with the court closures and the lack of funded or the no committed funding to the digital uh, to the digital strategy. Uh, you were seeking some clarity as to, you know, what kind of resource would be there. If that clarity doesn't come soon, could you maybe uh, advise the committee where you see the real difficulties uh, that, 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 that could uh, happen in the future? Uh, of course, yes. Um, and um, it, it, certainly some of the projects we know are, are coming out of existing funding. So, for instance, uh, video conferencing um, uh, with... Uh, uh, solicitors and clients uh, at prisons, um, but uh, there are other elements uh, around a justice digital strategy that we'd be very keen to see um, adequately funded. We see that there are significant efficiencies that can be made, uh, so we'd be um, you know, quite happy to report back to the committee if needs be. Could I just maybe come back to the question asked Mr. McCloskey? Yes, again? of course. Yes. Uh, again, I, I'm reading. You know, I'm reading from your your, your submission and. Uh, have you got the submission in front of you? Yeah. Okay. And if you go to the first, second, third paragraph, where you, where we welcome Police Scotland's continued commitment to provide funding. Yeah. Two areas. Mm -hmm. So my question to you, obviously with the SPA. And, and the police budget under pressure. What would be the impact if they reduced, if they, if they withheld funding from it, these years that you've identified? Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm with you now. So, it, what we were trying to say in our submission is that that's how the police fund those particular areas. They don't, as I said, they don't fund us to do that. No, but their funding has an impact yeah. on on what you're. What on our role work. is, I on, think that's on, John's on victim, point. Yeah, yes. and that's uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I get that. Um, so that that could be a concern for us if their if SPA funding does reduce and is altered in the fact that the the areas that they do fund, which is domestic violence, sexual crimes, and human trafficking, uh, so we welcome the creation of those specific units, but we would be concerned if the SPA budget uh, altered in the future. Uh, and identified other priority areas, whereas we firmly or support the fact that they've identified those areas as being in in need of support. So Does that answer your question? Yeah. N now, now that we've agreed that you did see it in your submission, you know, at the beginning yeah, no, no, for no, a I'm, moment sorry, there yeah. that, that, that I was misreading it. But however, my next question then is, mm. what dialogue do you have with Police Scotland about the continued funding from these areas? Um, we, we'll, we will meet with um, SPA and Police Scotland on a, on a range of issues at national level and identify areas of 
priorities for us uh, and, and, and dialogue. So we do have dialogue uh, with Police Scotland on a, on a regular basis um, to press home our, what we believe are the priorities for victims and witnesses of these particular crimes in particular. So we do have dialogue with them on that basis. And if Police Scotland are to reduce your funding on any specific areas, what area do you think would be the, the most likely that you, that, that you would give up? Yeah, again, I can only say it's not our, it's not our no, funding. I, think I understand John's point. What he's yeah. saying is but if they decrease the funding to the areas yeah. of domestic violence, human trafficking, what impact would that have on victim support? I think without saying you get the direct funding, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, might, it has an impact on the people you represent. Yeah, um, it could let victims and witnesses down on these particular crimes. These are very serious crimes. And if there is a reduction in the service by the that the funding is reduced, then we would have concerns over that. Okay. Does that answer? You? I hope that Scotland next. Week. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay. And we've got Police Scotland next week, so we can raise this issue. Yeah. It's an important issue, John. Yeah, no, I agree. It is a very important issue. Thank you. Thank you, um, Roderick. And I'm mindful of time, Roderick. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Um, I shall be brief, convener. Uh, I just wanted to come back a bit on the, the proposals for purpose-built justice centres. Uh, in the discussion so far, we've, we've perhaps raised the negatives in terms of transport difficulties and location. But uh, if we are to have kind of modern facilities and uh, proper facilities for victims and witnesses, uh, would you not agree that uh, the ex exploration of these purpose-built justice centres is a good idea, Mr McCloskey? Absolutely. Uh, we're fully committed to exploring and working with uh, Scottish Court Service uh, and other court users who all legitimately have a right to be in the court to say, how can we make this better than it has been in the past? So we have no issue with saying, let's work together to see what can be done in a positive way, because we know some of the courts are not fit for purpose. So we would very much be part of and want to be part of a process that actually finds a better way of having justice done in the future. Absolutely. Do you wish to comment? Um, just to add that uh, I think that it's a, a useful process to, uh, to go through to, to look locally at how justice can be provided. Um, obviously, there was the feasibility study in the borders. There may be other areas which might be suitable for examination in the future, for instance, the, the northeast of Scotland. Um, and um, I think we're broadly supportive of people um, you know, looking to discuss and collaborate on you know, sort of how physically justice might be delivered in local areas in the future. Okay. Um, just a small question for Mr. McCloskey in relation to criminal injuries compensation. You comment on that in your submission. Any... Any further comments you want to share with the, the committee on, on that aspect? Um, <clears throat> from our experience, certainly the, the changes that came in in 2012 to the criminal injuries scheme has affected a number of people who previously would have been eligible um, to receive awards. And it's not the necessarily the monetary award that makes a difference to victims and witnesses. It's often the closure or the acknowledgement by the state that something has happened. And we would certainly welcome further dialogue with the Scottish Government about improvements and changes to the criminal injuries scheme in Scotland. Uh, the CICA, Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority, is based in Glasgow. Um, and they're the UK, they cover the whole of the UK with that. So we would certainly look to develop, if we could, um, a Scottified version of that in the future. But obviously that's dependent on dialogue with the Scottish Government. So. And Mr Alexander, uh, obviously uh, uh, this committee's focus is not primarily in terms of examining legal aid, but in your submission you spend quite a lot of time on legal aid and obviously you have the discussion document. Uh, you do point out in Scotland we have a system which is demand-led for legal aid and not cash-limited. Um, what lessons can we learn from the approach to legal aid south of the border? Uh, certainly having a, a demand-led uh, budget can be um, a, a helpful way to uh, look at legal aid. Um, taking as one example, uh, we had the Supreme Court case in uh, 2010 around CADA, which introduced, uh, for the first time in a widespread way, um, access to a solicitor at a police station. Um, uh, clearly that needed to be, uh, to be funded, um, and uh, through the mechanism of advice and assistance that you know, we were able 
to, to accommodate that through the legal aid system um, and allow people to uh, receive advice um, and at levels which I think um, you know so far were significantly higher than we'd anticipated um, and certainly appear to be significantly higher than uh, south of the border. Um, uh, legal aid uh, south of the border has seen um, uh, significant pressure, um, uh, a budget of around uh, uh, two billion pounds a year, um, and uh, they have looked to uh, to cut that. Uh, through a series of uh, flat rate cuts to, uh, to criminal provision, uh, the uh, contracting of uh, duty slots at police stations and um, at court for uh, criminal legal aid, um, and through uh, uh, re-examination of the scope of legal aid um, in uh, civil matters, um, and in particular removing areas in which there wasn't a, effectively a human rights uh, protection uh, so including uh, family law, uh, unless there was um, any suggestion of uh, uh, domestic abuse, in which case it could be dealt with separately, um, uh, housing, education, consumer uh, debt and other areas. Uh, although retaining a, uh, an exceptional case status to allow any case that might otherwise fall outside um, uh, the scope of legal aid to be brought forward, uh, although, um, as I understand it, the, uh, the rate at which that has been allocated has been uh, around uh, less than 5% of any applications for exceptional case status. Um, obviously, they have uh, 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 taken these approaches uh, to a significant uh, set of financial pressures that, uh, that the Ministry of Justice and the Legal Aid Agency face. Um, uh, we have not dissimilar pressures here in Scotland um, and uh, have... Um, uh, published a discussion paper, which, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, you know, sort of we've shared with, with members and justice stakeholders overall. Uh, one of the, the suggestions in that paper is to, um, to consider scope. So that is uh, a, a suggestion in uh, common uh, with uh, the situation in England and Wales, although with a, a different emphasis rather than the, um, the blanket removals from scope that have taken place in England and Wales. I know you asked us, I don't really, really get into your discussion paper about legal aid. You're moving really away from what we're talking about is the court's budget. Uh, apologies. No, it's not your fault. It's Roddy's fault. Well, Roddy no, I, 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 well I, just take the blame. It'd be nice. In, in, it's a good chunk of the Law Society submission is about legal aid, so I thought I had to just you, you did, try. But I, I just yeah, okay. to... There's another, another time, another place for that. Can we? No, I don't want to go back down yeah. your legal aid discussion paper. Is there okay, anything else? There. I'll leave it there. Right, right, thank you. I'm going to stop right there. If you feel there's something we should have asked and we didn't ask, budget-related, please write and let us know. We've got a very tight timetable today, so just let us know if there's anything you want to say additionally to your submission following on questions from members. Thank you very much. I'll suspend for two minutes to allow witnesses to change over. Uh, can I, um, right, we're back, and I welcome, welcome our second panel of witnesses, and now we have a, a, a rather large gallery. I could remind everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices. 
and even if they're switched to silent, they interfere with broadcasting. I welcome Catherine Dyer, Crown Agent and Chief Executive of Crown Office and Procurator of Fiscal Service, Fiona Eady, Secretary of Procurator of Fiscal Society Section FDA Union, and Brian Carroll, Branch Secretary in the Scottish Court Service, Public and Commercial Services Union. And I know that you were in for the evidence of the previous um, panel of witnesses, so I'll go straight to um, questions from members. Elaine, you were quick, John, and then uh, Alison. And then Margaret, right, Elaine. Yes, um, both the uh, Crown Office and Procurator uh, Fiscal Service and the FDA submissions uh, suggest that there has been a significant increase in reports of certain types of serious crime. So although uh, the number of cases is falling altogether, the actual complexity of cases is, is increasing. Um, COP says that this is very challenging and we are looking to realise savings from people and process reviews uh, and... We all, um, I think, in the FDA a submission, uh, you also indicate that the staffing budget is actually cut, being cut in real terms. So presumably that means a decrease in staffing. Can you give some indication how these sorts of challenges can be reconciled? And I meant to say your microphone come automatically if I call you. Miss Edia, you look as if you're in the starting block there. <laughs> <laughs> Where would you? Uh, yes, no, yeah, that's fine. Give me that look you see and I take the hint. Yes, that's fine. Well, First of all, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting us to come and give evidence today. Uh, it's been some time uh, since the uh, Procurator Fiscal Society has been asked to, uh, to come along, so FDA welcomes the opportunity uh, to, to do that. Um, I think in relation to um, the, the point about uh, the number of cases falling, um, in fact, uh, overall case reports um, uh, since 2010-11 have gone up uh, by about 10%. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but the, the, the point that, that we were making specifically um, in our submission was about the, the, the types and nature um, of those cases um, and the complexity and therefore the resource demands in dealing with them. Um, and yes, you're absolutely right that uh, although there is a real terms uh, increase in the budget for the organisation, there is a £1.1 million uh, cut uh, in the staffing budget um, for the organisation, and that will undoubtedly result in uh, fewer jobs. Perhaps, Dyer, yes. Perhaps safe from point of view. I think the letter that uh, we submitted in terms of information for the committee was to sort of point out that we agree this is very challenging, and what we're trying to do is actually, uh, we haven't agreed necessarily what our budgets, we're just going through our budgets for uh, our different federations and units just now, and what we're looking to do is to protect the staffing uh, and take money from other areas where we're looking to have savings and I think we explained some of it in terms of the technology that we're using so that we can make sure really in terms of as an organisation it's very important to us obviously to have sufficient lawyers to do the type of work that we're talking about. Um, in recent years we've moved into uh, specialised units because that gives us sort of better uh, quality outcomes and people are used to what they're doing and they can do it more quickly. So we're doing a variety of things in terms of technology and also movement of staff to try and make sure that although we have challenging times, um, that we really make sure we've got enough people to do the work that's required in terms of the legal complement. Um, the FDA um, point out there is that actually since December 2009 there's been an overall 12% reduction in permanent staffing levels. I mean, is that a, a pressure that you've not got the, the permanent well, staff available no, uh, I think to take on these complex cases, what, which probably need What we've more tried to move to, and this is certainly part of it, I mean, our business is split into several parts, so there's, there are still some less complicated cases. I think what we've tried to do is to move the permanent staff who are the most experienced into dealing, and they're specially trained now for the different types of things in terms of sexual offending and domestic abuse. I think the committee may have heard some of that before. Uh, we do have a number of what we call fixed term uh, staff in terms of legal staff and also administrative staff and these are people that we can take on to try and relieve when we have pressure that we cannot meet with the permanent staffing figures. Um, at the moment um, the position is that the vast majority of staff with us are permanent um, and it's difficult, I think we've agreed, in terms of staffing numbers, you can take a snapshot at any one time and talk about percentages. I think what we've all realised in public sector now, especially in the justice system, is it's a kind of, I think I've used the phrase before, a movable feast. It's what comes in through the door, and therefore you have to sort of try and match your resource, and it's going to be flexible up and down a bit. I think certainly when we look at the graphs of work coming in, 
it isn't predictable to say that you'll get X amount every month. That's not how it works. Um, it is about what kind of cases, and there's been some big cases I think the committee will have seen in the news recently where we've had to obviously move specific resources to deal with them, and that means we've got a responsibility to make sure that the day-to-day -day work is also covered. What sort of pressures are staff, I mean, generally, what sort of pressures are staff under at the moment? You know, is, is that, a, in terms, I mean, we've, we've heard already from some other parts of the police service about pressures on staff, about concerns about stress and workload, is that yes, also that's right. a, a, a concern? Um, la last yourself? year, um, both of the, the unions um, in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service conducted a, 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 a stress audit, um, and at that time, around 80% um, of our members um, said that they had concerns about uh, workload, uh, reducing uh, staff levels um, and about the lack of court preparation time. Um, and about a quarter of those who responded said um, that those concerns um, were a, a cause of stress uh, to them. So we do have significant concerns about the health and well-being of our members um, in operating in circumstances where uh, they find that their workload is increasing. Um, and I think you know, that was one of the points that we wanted to, to make in our submission, that it's it's not just about looking at the numbers of cases that we receive, um, because you know cases the, the, those numbers can go up and down. It's about the type of cases that we're dealing with, um, and in fact, of their very nature, um, the, the complexity of them, the serious nature of them, and actually the personal impact that it, that it can have on dealing with um, cases involving um, serious sexual offences, for example, um, offences against children, or, or you know a, a, a wide variety of that type of work, is very demanding on individuals. Um, so it, it's that those combined pressures um, which cause us concern. Mr. Carroll. Yes, if I, if I can, I recognise uh, what the FDA are saying about the pressures on, on staff. Obviously, I can only speak for the members within Scottish Court Service, but um, a lot of what has been said by the FDA is reflected by our members within Scottish Court Service as well. Um, for example, uh, we are getting uh, feedback from the ground uh, consistently that our members are in court more than they ever have been. Um, for example, clerks of court don't have any uh, real time to concentrate on the people management aspects of their, of their job because of the pressures that are there in having to resource the courts that are necessary to deal with the cases. Again, it's not all about the numbers, it's about the complexity of the cases, and that is something that we as a branch have been raising with Scottish Court Service Management for some time. Some of the, the figures look as if they're easily managed, but you have to look behind the figures to see in actual fact what is, is happening there. And uh, for example, um, due to the, the budget cuts previously, uh, within Scottish Court Service, there was a reduction over the piece of 120 odd staff but because of the increase in the criminal business coming through the courts in some aspects of that, in some areas, um, the increase has been as much as 25% because of a change in policy by the police and the prosecutors in the way that they were uh, marking uh, cases and looking at cases. An additional £1 million had to be provided to Scottish Court Service for additional staff and judicial resource which had just been cut four or five years ago. Now, this was something that we raised at the Justice Committee at the time of the court closures, that that was a concern for our branch, that the resilience indeed possibly wasn't there in terms of the number of cases that may come through if a change in marking policy or a change in policing actually occurred. And I think this has, been, this has borne fruit. Mm. So the one million was reallocated... Back in, you said. I think it's in the Scottish Court Service um, evidence, page three, one million pound to provide additional staff and judicial resource to support the increase in road to traffic, domestic abuse and sexual offence cases reflecting the proactive approach taken by the police and prosecutors. If I can certainly assist the committee with that, I think that's evidence of the flexibility that we're trying to have around the justice system because really quite frankly um, as Fiona said 
I think everybody is trying to deal with a huge upsurge in terms of the sexual offending reporting and domestic abuse reporting. Now, it's very important, obviously, for the victims of these crimes that both the police and ourselves and the courts are able to process that work properly. But in some senses, it, it came out of the blue, almost, if you like. I think we've talked before about the Savile effect. Certainly, the publicity around um, various convictions has encouraged victims to come forward. And I don't think, to be perfectly frank, that anybody in the justice system really anticipated that. That is something that came to all of us as a surprise. We've had several years where before we've had spikes in that type of reporting, but nothing quite so sustained and long. I mean, over the past two and a half years, it's almost doubled in certain areas. And to give you an example, in the High Court at the moment, we think that roughly 70% of the cases are sexual offending cases. Now, when I was in the High Court unit in Crown Office in the mid-1990s, you could easily say that it was less than a quarter of the cases. So for everybody that's in the judicial system, uh, the court system, as working the system, or, or procurator's fiscal, there's a huge... You know, that's a now mainstream work for us, whereas before... Um, it was a smaller portion, and quite often domestic abuse is also connected with sexual violence, and we're getting cases where there are many more charges and many more victims. Uh, and I think Fiona's quite right to point out that that does obviously have, uh, I think, on, on judges and prosecutors and police and the court staff, you know, everybody, but we're well, it has an impact. Uh, and in Crown Office and the Prosecutor Fiscal Service, we have a vicarious trauma a project where people who feel affected by dealing with the cases can sort of go in contact to try and get some counselling and resilience through that. But as a matter of fact, I suppose, as the prosecution service and the justice system, that's our job is to sort of deal with the victims and make sure that the accused are brought to justice in this. But I don't think anybody's underestimating that it's been a huge upsurge. And um, the Justice Directorate provided extra money to Crown Office and Fiscal Service and to Scottish Courts to deal with the cases that we've got currently going through. I mean, do you need additional resources? I mean, is, is that really the answer? I mean, you, you mentioned te in the development of innovative technology solutions, mm -hmm. but I don't really see how innovative technology solutions can help you to deal with these types of cases. Well, is it just additional resource really that's needed? Our concern has been that... Um, you know, we know that there are there is work underway uh, within the organisation to uh, to streamline work processes um, and to um, try and make benefit um, from uh, information technology. For example, um, our anxiety, however, is that you know those benefits may well be felt some months or or weeks or years down the line. And for our members, they're struggling with the situation as it is now, um, and they really need a solution to it sooner than that um, you know our, our view is that, that we don't see how we can continue um, to provide um, the the same or improved levels um, of uh, of service um, based on the current trajectory um, with reducing staff numbers we don't see that that's possible yeah if I can say I think the position is that we are also very mindful I mean I think the point was that uh, we went to the government uh, directorate, the Justice Directorate and explained that we had some big cases just now that in years past we would have absorbed into our budget that just was not possible and again we were given money last year and for this coming year to allow us to deal with these particular big cases, there's three very big cases that we've got and that allowed us to backfill with staff further down the organisation so that these cases, that money was really allocated to deal with these big cases and in terms, as I say, of the extra sexual offending domestic abuse cases we've got just now, again, we went to the Justice Board, we had a very comprehensive discussion between all the people that sit around the Justice Board, which includes the police, Scottish courts, uh, the children's reporter um, and legal aid, and said that really what we were seeing were cases that if we didn't get additional funding at this stage, it would be difficult to put them through the system, and that funding was made available. So I think the position that we're in just now is that there is a recognition that the, the justice system needs to be flexible in terms of what it's dealing with, because it's obviously going to be unacceptable to say to victims of crime, we're not able to deal with your case at the moment. But I think what has happened is that the Justice Directorate and ourselves sitting around the Justice Board table have recognised that and are working very hard to make sure that we're predicting properly what comes in the future and flexing our resource 
in the justice system as a whole to allow us to deal with these cases. But I don't think you could, I certainly agree with Fiona that you can't underplay that for everybody. And I wouldn't just include our staff. I think it also affects the judiciary here and police officers dealing with it. That it is a, you know very difficult areas of work, challenging areas of work, and we have to make sure that people's sort of health and welfare are taken care of as well. But at the bottom line of it is we are here to sort of serve the public and to serve victims. And our job is to try and do that while still sort of looking after our staff at the same time. Can I just I, I ask you this as well, Mr. Carroll? So, this the Justice Director, do you have set meetings with them or ad hoc meetings? Uh, I, I'm not talking about the maybe systemic pressures, but also the blips that go up and down due to certain demands in certain cases or certain things that become policy to be prosecuted. How do you? How does it actually work in practice? And you. You're meeting the Justice Director, and are the, are the um, public, uh, public Commercial Services Union represented at those meetings as well? You're not. So I'll come to you, but I just wanted to know how that yeah, actually works. What, what happens is, um, for the past few years, we've had a justice board. Uh, before, as we've talked about, you know, all the, the, the elements of justice have to be somewhat separate. Clearly, the police have to be separate from the prosecutor. The prosecutor acts independently as separate from the courts. But what we're trying to do is to say that it's a joint endeavour in terms of how we manage work through the system. And so we have monthly meetings of the Justice Board where we sort of highlight things and we've got a number of working groups underneath that. And one of them in particular is looking at what business is coming in. We've got much more sophisticated about understanding that in terms of, as Fiona said, it's not case numbers per se, it is about the type of case. So if you have, you know, a thousand speeding cases, that's very easily dealt with doesn't take a lot of time of, it, of anybody involved in the system, but if it's a thousand sexual abuse cases, then clearly it's a different matter. Yes, it was just on the on the, the point about um, uh, victims and witnesses and obviously jurors, and I don't think we should forget the accused as well, that, you know, for justice to be delivered uh, timelessly, efficiently and effectively, then all aspects of the justice system need to be uh, catered for. And at the moment, for example, the waiting period or the average waiting period uh, for a summary criminal trial in Glasgow and Strathkelvin is 19 weeks. It's 18 weeks in Grampian Highlands and Islands, and it's 23 weeks in Lothian and Borders. The target is 16 weeks. Now, in Lothian and Borders especially, we're expecting that target to uh, increase uh, in, the, in the waiting times from about 23 weeks to maybe 30 weeks, and that's due to the closure of uh, Haddington. Thank you. Do you want to? I'd let others follow up on that in a minute. Just, just want to, John Finney followed by Alison, followed by Margaret, followed by Sandra. Thank you, <laughs> Commissioner. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, Elaine's asked many of the questions I was going to ask about the FDA. Submission. A question to you, uh, Ms Dyer, um, picking up on Mr Carroll's point and one alluded to in uh, Ms Edie's submission, and that is, in the, the part of our, our submission about the budget, the comment that um, well, the, the cons but financial consequences will have an, um, a detrimental effect on our members' professional ability to prosecute cases in a timely and effective manner. Now, following on from the timescales that, that have to be complied with, is that something that will see any redirection within your budget to, to address that, or is that? I, I think. I mean, again, I credit to the staff uh, that actually, in terms of uh, making the decisions in cases, we actually are still exceeding our own uh, self-imposed target. We work. Um, again, across the justice system, that the police have 28 days is, is the target that they try to aspire to, to report cases to us from caution and charge. We then try to take a, a, a maximum of 28 days to make the decision. And thereafter, if it's going to court, it goes on to the court system. And there's an overarching target that from caution and charge to disposal of a summary case, it should take 26 weeks is really what we're aspiring to do. Now, we're still meeting that across the justice system just now, but I think we're just all very much aware that we have to keep an eye on all these things and to move the resource about so that we do make sure that we're not... In, causing by our resource allocation any delays and things. But some of the cases that we have, to be frank, 
you know, I think I explained in my submission about the pre-petition, the sort of sexual cases that come in and, and other big serious crime cases where it's not immediately clear that we will have enough evidence and we have to do more investigation and certainly that is a kind of hidden part of the mountain if you like, that's under the sea <laughs> and that's a, a big amount of work and I think we've given you figures for that. Can I commend the, the comments you've made about the staff? I think it's mm -hmm. very important that they are valued and treated that way. Can I also ask about your own submission and the, the annex that was put in? Yes. And, and the second page of that, <clears throat> we are here to scrutinise the budget. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and at the bottom of that page where you talk about um, non-court disposals, Yes. is there ever a budgetary consideration to disposing of something? Um, I think the thing is that all public authorities and the crowns included in that have to look at best value. So what we try and do is we talk about the outcomes. We're looking for optimum outcomes and it's got to be proportionate. So I think reference was made in the, the last session to summary justice reform and I think members will be uh, familiar with that, that that allowed Procurator's Fiscal to issue fiscal fines and fiscal compensation orders. We've now also got fiscal work orders where we can ask that the accused person does up to 50 hours of work in the community. And really what we're looking to do is to sort of recalibrate some of the actions we've got because at the end of the day, we want to put things into court that have to be dealt with by court, but if there are things that can be dealt with by a direct measure, we really want to put them down to direct measure. And that's been quite successful. We've got a lot of people who get one direct measure and don't come back into the system. Well, that's good to hear. Mm. I'm very supportive of that approach. Are you able to assign any figure to any of these particular disposals, if you like, a consequential saving from a non-appearance at court? Well, we do. I mean, again, I can provide that to the committee. Uh, we've got uh, costings that are sort of your average type costing, and obviously it's clearly, from the public purse point of view, if somebody can be dealt with proportionally by a direct measure, then that's a lot cheaper than them going to court. What and we've got to balance out is that, you know, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're balancing out that really we want to try and end up that what we've got in court are things that have to have a court disposal. Okay, uh, well, if you could provide that, we'll that would do, be very yes. helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Alison, by Margaret, please. Um, can I start by following up on a couple of things that Ms Dyer said earlier? I mean, you, you talked about the difficulty of understanding where your workload was coming from and called it a movable feast, and, and obviously you couldn't anticipate the, um, the results of the Savile effect sort of thing, but you could have, uh, I believe, un anticipated um, that if, if Police Scotland was focusing on domestic abuse in the way that it had done, that you would have an upsurge in, in the cases. And do you think, with hindsight, you reacted quickly enough to reallocate resources uh, within the organisation to deal with that? I think we have, but I, I think it's a bit like tang turning tankers we've been talking about. In some senses, there's a sort of flotilla of justice ships, if you like, because there is, there's the police ship, there's us, there's the courts, there's uh, the sort of social, criminal justice social work, there's ASSIST and all the other organisations in Victim Support Scotland, all of whom have to sort of adjust to changes in the, the workload. So I think, in, in hindsight, I think we have dealt with it. I think what we've learned is how long it takes for us all to join up together. So I have to say, I think that Crown Office and the Fiscal Service and the staff in, in the service were almost the first to flag up. And we were looking at what numbers we were getting from the police, the numbers that we were able to proceed with, which was considerably increased. And that was because of the better uh, detection and the attention that they were giving to these cases. And really, kind of the proof is in the, of the puddings and the eating. So until they had started doing that for a sustained length of time, you can't say it's a trend. As soon as we saw that we thought that it was a trend, we went back to our criminal justice partners and spoke to the police and to the courts and to the justice board to say, we think this is a trend that's not going to diminish in the next few years. It's probably going to increase and then plateau. We're kind of at the stage that we think that it might have plateaued, we hope. Um, obviously, in terms of the, at the end of the day, there can only be a limited number of people that are carrying out offences of that sort in the community. And because the police have been so efficient at detecting this and encouraging victims to come forward, we are hopeful that we are seeing that this is the, the top of the, the plateau of this. Um, but what we've learned is that it does take time. And I suppose now we've got more of the institutional uh, discussions in place to allow us to react more quickly. Follow up. Do yeah. Police Scotland now understand the, the, the yes. scale of the challenge when they introduce these new mm -hmm. initiatives? And, yes. and perhaps there should be more dialogue in advance of... I think of, we're, of we're finding now, I mean, that's Police Scotland, that's, you know, I, 
almost two years now that they've been in force. And certainly, um, I think at the beginning, it obviously took time for everything to settle down. But actually, relatively quickly, we've got to the point where um, we have meetings out with the Justice Board of ourselves, Police Scotland and the courts, just to have a check on what's coming up and what changes in policy there might be and to talk through the consequences. So none of us would wish to interfere. I mean, I won't want to interfere with the sort of operational independence of the police. Uh, the courts don't wish to interfere with our independence or that of the police, but we do need to work together to be sure that we've got, you know, we understand what we're trying to manage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think there is an issue about the domestic abuse cases that you're referring to, which is not just about um, an increased number of cases being reported, it's also mm -hmm. the type of cases that yeah. are being reported because I think we made reference to the domestic abuse task force mm -hmm. and, and so the nature of those cases are you're not just talking about one complainer and one accused person, mm -hmm. you, you, you may be talking about multiple complainers perhaps spanning a period of years um, and so they are more also again more complex um, and, and uh, more resource intensive to, to, to prepare mm -hmm. um, uh, we provided some examples about the, the comparison of, of how long it takes to prepare um, a, 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 a normal if you like um, a high court case um, and uh, one of the domestic abuse task force cases uh, it's, about, it's roughly about three times as long in our experience um, so, so there is a, a, a factor there to be aware of yeah, and Mr. Carroll wants to come Sorry. in as well, so Mr. Carroll. Yeah, it was just to, to add to that, that actually might be reflected in some of the, the figures. Um, I recognise the 26-week target, and I don't have uh, any figures for that, but, for example, we, we have in Scottish Court Service a 20-week target, and it's percentage of summary accused, summary accused disposed of within 20 weeks, and I think that's from first calling to a uh, disposal. Now, for example, uh, April to September last year, Glasgow Sheriff Court, the percentages in dealing with those cases, bearing in mind uh, if we're in the green zone, it's 85% and above, Glasgow Sheriff Court was 50, 48, 51, 51, 51 and 48. This year, for the same period, it's 46, 46, 42, 48, 48 and 37. So the performance has significantly dropped. And that's reflected in a lot of uh, the courts across across the piece. But also, I was just very quickly uh, looking at trials evidence-led. And this is where the pressures for uh, both the FDA's members and our members uh, come in, and for the court service and uh, procurator fiscal staff in general that 29 out of the 47 courts, that's the vast majority of courts, have seen an increase in trials led. Now, I'm not arguing with the fact that we want to get to a position whereby the trials that are going ahead are the ones that are necessary to go ahead, but there is obviously pressures there within the system that have to be, have to be dealt with, and I think that's reflected in the fact that that extra £1 million was given to Scottish Court Service to fund additional staff to, to man the courts. I just want to make one, one other point. The, what I mentioned previously about um, the people management aspect conflicting with staff going, in, going into court, that's actually now uh, at the behest of Scottish Court Service Director on the risk register for Scottish Court Service. So they are recognising, indeed, that there are pressures on staff not being able to possibly focus as much as they would like on the people management side of things, which is part of their everyday job and a big part of their everyday job because they have to nurture and encourage and train and uh, learn and develop the staff that are coming through. And they're not getting the time to do that properly because they're having to go into court. And we're getting out those reports uh, on a regular basis. Ms. Dyer, you spoke about having to go to the Justice Board for extra resources, and you, you, I think you described that as a flexible way. Um, it, it, 
perhaps to other sounds like firefighting, do you think the budget needs to be increased for, for you in order to be able to properly manage this, this sort of workload that we've heard about? I, this I think that what we need to do is to be able to respond to what it is that comes through the door. We're making sort of choices, I think, in terms of being a, as sensible as we can, that it's proportionate. If we can deal with it without it going to court, then that's what we'll do. Um, but I think, uh, for me, this showed that the Justice Board way of working is a flexible approach. As we say, it's not. It's very difficult to predict how long we can sort of look and, you know, really till somebody is arrested and is cautioned and charged, we don't know that they're coming into the system. And it does very much, to, you know, it's, it's what crime is committed and what crime is reported and what crime is detected and the proportion of that that then has sufficient evidence while we still have the rule of corroboration for us to deal with it. So you've got quite a big... Uh, expansive things, it narrows down as it's coming through and I just think that we've got better at understanding what it is and better at working together and certainly the Justice Board and the organisations that sit around it are very committed to making sure that we make it work for the, the, the cases that come before us that have to go into court. Uh, so at the moment what we have is we identified that we had additional work that would not fit within the current programme that we had at the beginning of the year that was a Justice Board decision to sort of allow funding to be flexible across the justice system and to assist Scottish courts and ourselves in putting extra courts on and having extra staff, and that's what's happened. I haven't been able to do, you know, allocate those resources towards the end of the year. It would, have been, would have it would have been a slowing down of the system. Now, I take the point that in some senses, obviously, the system did, and again, this is the point about how long it takes to get things through. But again, credit, I think, to the staff, uh, both in Scottish courts and our staff, that the, the figures I gave in the submission to the committee, I think you'll see that the point we were trying to make was that more cases in all courts, except sheriff and jury, had more cases disposed of, in other words, more conclusions come to in the past year than before. So there was quite significant increases, a 10% increase in the JP court number concluded, a 2% increase in sheriff and jury, and a 1% increase in high court. But at the same time, within that workload, there were far more cases had gone to trial in that period. And that's partly a reflection of the kind of, of uh, work that is going through, because people accused of domestic abuse or sexual offending in our experience tend not to plead guilty quite as readily as people who are accused of more sort of what we'd have thought was old-fashioned crime that came before courts such as theft or whatever. So I think it's a credit to the people that work in the system that in actual fact what we've had here is an overall increase in the number of cases that have come to a conclusion at the same time as more of them are actually going to trial. Yeah, I mean, it clearly is a, a system under quite a lot of pressure yes. at the moment. If it slows down very much more, surely you're at risk of what I think the FDA points out of, of starting to hit time bars and things well, like that. I don't think, I mean, I think the thing is, I think we're far, far from that, I have to say. We have self-imposed targets that we sort of set uh, in the sort of late 1990s and have adjusted as we've gone through, depending on what level of business we've got. Uh, but we are not in danger of missing any statutory time targets for cases. What we are doing is sort of reallocating, and that was part of the pro part of what we were trying to do was to move to have extra courts from September to the end of this financial year, so that we go into the next financial year trying to get reduced times for it to take from caution and charge to to sort of being disposed of. And I think that was a, a good reaction. I think that's what people would expect us to have done. Mr. Carroll. Yeah, I was just uh, on that uh, last point. Um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was certainly within the last uh, six months. Paisley uh, Sheriff Court had 42 first diets calling on a Monday for a sitting of two weeks in length uh, beyond, beyond that date. Edinburgh very recently had a similar experience. In a two-week sitting, you're probably looking at getting uh, through maybe between one and five sheriff and jury trials within that two-week sitting, depending on what happens. So 42 indictments are never ever going to be continued to that two-week uh, sitting. Now, I can't say how widespread that is, but that's two, two examples of where there was certainly pressure uh, on the system and on the, on the staff of both Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and the Scottish Court Service. And a lot of the, the time bars, which was the point that was being made there, had to be extended to keep the indictments alive. 
rights uh, to, the, to the committee? Well, the, the, you mean the, time bars extended? Yeah, if, so, if someone's in custody, the 110-day the rule kicks in where their uh, uh, trial has to be heard within that 110 days. So some of those time bars would have been extended to allow that to happen. But also in some, I think, statutory cases, there may be time bars as well as to when the offence has to come into court. Okay, thank you. Finish. Just press my CD on, on our evidence. You've said that you've been told by our members an increasing number of these serious cases at Sheriff and High Court level are being indicted on the last day of service before the time bar. Information we have, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Margaret, followed by Sandra, followed by Roderick. Uh, good morning. There seems to be a bit of a disconnect, uh, Ms Dyer, between what you're saying, you know, indictments aren't in danger. Clearly that last bit that... Um, Let's explain that. I think it's quite complicated. We, we have most of the work in the High Court is custody work. Now, from the Crown's point of view, what we have to do is um, we have to be ready to serve the indictment on the accused person 80 days after they first appeared for full committal in terms of the court. Now, that's not, it's not 80 working days, it's 80 days. And uh, our staff work very hard to make sure that the indictments are ready for that. It wouldn't be uncommon. You've got to, it's, it's quite a complicated system. You've got a, a date when it's fixed for a preliminary hearing for the, the, the court, and that's got to be within a certain time span. So to have indictments being served on the last day is not necessarily an indication that we're not able to cope with what we're doing. Equally well with some of the custody, the, the, the bail cases, by the time we do the very thorough investigation that we've got to do, and I've talked about the number of cases that we don't even put on petition but can take up to a year or more to investigate, equally with ones that we do think we've got enough to put it on, there can be, and again, it's the nature of victims and all the rest of it, we have to really be very careful and sort of we are now having conversations with all the victims in sexual cases to make sure that they understand what's likely to happen in the process. And again... What I, I think we can guarantee is, at the end of the day, we are not concerned that we're going to be missing time bars in cases. And that there will always be a proportion of the cases that are served on the last day that's possible for service. But that's always been the case. And I had asked uh, our High Court unit, we were sort of looking at that, and we think that there are other things that we could do to try and make sure that we, you know, we're, we're definitely not going to be in the system of, of making victims not have their cases go to trial. That's just not, not what we'll do. We would move resource to make sure that that didn't happen. Yeah, well, notwithstanding that very long explanation, do you think it's acceptable that increasingly your staff is being put in that position where it is the very last date? before they're, they're looking at that and they're complaining about I don't, I don't think I don't think they're looking at the case. What this is is about the technical serving of papers. Well, do you think that's acceptable? I do you think it's acceptable, be. yes. So that will be something that will well, I think I think that's something that we've always done. I, I think I can understand the position, like Fiona's trying to indicate, that because the cases are more complex and we've got more of them and there's more in custody, then more of them are in that position that they're being served on what is the technical last day but I have to say the people are in custody they're in prison and what happens is the indictments go up to prison and they're served on them in prison so there's not a, there's not a danger of us missing But it's the complexity of the case maybe mm -hmm. a number of witnesses, maybe yes. expert witnesses, doesn't this point to resource and aren't you doing as chief executive of the, the service, your members, a great disservice to talk about constantly flexing on resource optimising on resource, there comes a point well, you just can't do that anymore. You need a core increase in resources, in staffing. Well, that may come, but what I'm saying is at the moment, again, if I can explain, you know, if we've got a sudden increase where for the past two years there's a huge uplift, and if you look at the figures, we're talking about 50% increases in very technically difficult cases, then we obviously have to say, what do we do to deal with that? We've dealt with it. We need to keep working, looking forward with the other bits of the justice system to say, is this a permanent state of affairs or is it, as we expect, that it will return back down? And obviously, if you look at the crime figures, and I think we're agreed now that it's, it's not sufficient to look at figures. If you look at the crime figures, but the amount of different types of work within it, which we're very good at doing now, you can see there's been a huge increase in these cases. And we've dealt with it and we've additional resource that we've got to deal with that. I think the point is we need to keep looking forward to say what is the resource that we're going to need as we're going forward. That's the position. Fairly predictable to say that the Domestic Abuse Task Force is there 
and these mm -hmm. um, serious sexual assaults and, and cases are going to come forward and you know these already that these are more complex. You've already said there's constant change mm -hmm. um, in the system uh, within a background of budgetary constraints. It seems to be, if I were in your shoes, I'd be asking for more resources to cope for this well, for well, your members I, I to compete doing the very excellent service we all acknowledge that they are doing. Well, but I have to tell you, um, Ms. Dyer, this isn't just the evidence here. I, I see it in my local court, um, the morale of Crown and Procurator Fiscals, the lack of preparation time, sometimes very serious cases, laundering that's gone on for ages, going and being um, being abandoned because the fiscal was under such pressure. That's not sustainable, is it? I think if, if I, as I said to the committee, we have been back and asked for the money for the big cases. We have been back and explained the position that was jointly with the Scottish Court Service about what was happening for the mainstream sexual offending and domestic abuse cases that we're dealing with, and we did get additional resource for that. But so you're firefighting. I, it's not firefighting. I, I don't. I, I really have to object to that. I have to say, as a public servant responsible for public expenditure, I wouldn't expect that you would think that I should be asking for things when I don't have work for it to be carried out with. What we've done here is said we've had an increase in this kind of work. We need an increase in resource, and we got an increase in resource. Now, you can talk about firefighting or you can talk about planning for expenditure on work that is, has arisen, which is what I would say that was. Um, and the position is that in terms of these cases, they are well prepared. Um, we also expect that because of previous experience, for example, if I can say when there was uh, a concentration at the beginning of the uh, sort of hate crime uh, work that we were doing in terms of uh, cases with racial abuse or whatever, we had a similar upsurge where people were confident about reporting. So we had more of that coming out. But at the same time, what the prosecution service is doing as part of the justice system is to educate the public to say behaviour like this is not acceptable. And so when you look at the trajectory, we had low reporting when people weren't confident. The more that we made clear from the police and ourselves that people were to come forward and we would deal with them within the court system, the reporting went up. And at the same time as the reporting went up, it began to be that there was publicity about these cases and the offending rate of these went down. And we are hoping that there has now been such a focus on the fact that victims of sexual abuse, if they come forward immediately, it prevents somebody else becoming a victim of the same perpetrator. And equally with domestic abuse, what we're seeing is that uh, in years past, you know, people were not confident about reporting it. And we had perpetrators, as Fiona's explaining, with the domestic abuse cases who went on to serial relationships with people where they dealt very badly and assaulted their partners. And that's all coming out in the wash, if you like, now. But we've asked for additional resource and got additional resource. And I don't think that's firefighting. I think that's appropriately... Firefighting, that's additional resource because it may not happen next year. But you know you've got other changes in the system mm -hmm. constantly whether that's from um, the right of victims to, to question uh, some of the Crown mm -hmm. and Procurator Fiscal's decision, whether that's new legislation coming through, as it is constantly. And meantime, you've got a report here, and we have evidence here, of 80%, 81% of the legal staff respondents saying they have con serious, serious concerns about preparation time. My goodness, it doesn't get much ba more basic than that, about workload and staffing levels. So I ask you again... I mean, isn't there a case for an increase in your core funding? Remember, your staffing budget has actually decreased. No, my, I have to say my staffing budget, that's Fiona's, Fiona's interpretation. And I explained that at this stage, what we're doing is setting budgets. And what we intend to do is, and I think our mantra has always been um, that when we've got money available, we move it to having staffing resources as much as possible. And the way that the finances of Crown Office and the Fiscal Service are set out, we have a resource budget that is far bigger than any capital budget that we have. And the bulk of that, we move to work with staff. And that's why it's important when we're talking about the technological changes that we're making. Because what we're Which doing with do that... Which do take time. They're not well, going to have but we are, I, can I, If I can explain, we've been year, working in this... Sorry, yeah. we've been working on this assumption for several years now. It was very obvious what was going to happen with public finances. So I'm afraid we're ready with some of the technological things. We have a website instead of people uh, having to phone up and talk that we can give witnesses, for instance, in particular cases, access to a piece of the website that's 
purely dedicated for them, where they can email us about their particular case and they can get information about what's happening. And that saves people resource, if you like, that we can then move on to working in cases behind the scenes. And we're about uh, to go forward with um, our uh, iPad in court uh, project, which we tried out, I think, two years ago now, and left in, in a number of offices so that the staff could have a, a good go at that and tell us what they wanted improved. We've taken that back and we're ready to go back out with the finalised version of that into the proof of concept but offices. despite all of that, Ms Starr, we're hearing about targets still being missed and well, targets being missed on a regular basis. And Mr Carroll has, has already said no. that. With respect, I don't think I'm going to get too much further. Well, uh, I think it depends what target. I mean, it depends what target. That's internal target of Scottish Court Service that Mr mm -hmm. Carroll is talking about, which is a matter for Scottish Court Service. I'm concerned about our targets. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that at the moment... Sometimes that's because the, the fiscal hasn't been prepared or not ready and hasn't um, got enough time to do the job that they, they were employed to do. I, well, I think that our staff do very well under very pressing conditions. I don't it's doubt a, it's a, that. It's I'm, a constant... I'm questioning why it should be pressed uh, to this extent and why there shouldn't be an increase in core funding. On a matter of clarification, the figures that we took um, were from the level three breakdown of the amount that was set aside in the COPFS budget for, um, I can't remember the, 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 the different terminology, there's DEL funding and resource funding and staffing, and the breakdown in terms of the analysis as to whether it amounted to a £1.1 million cut was taken from the SPICE uh, briefing. Um, and that was how we came up with the, the figure for £1.1 million uh, cut in the, in, the, in the amount set aside within the overall budget for staffing. Um, but I, I think just on a, on a general point, um, it is, you know, we, we represent uh, senior civil servants when we represent um, procurators fiscal in, in court at all, all grades. Um, and it is the job of senior civil servants um, to manage the budget that they are provided with. Um, so we, we make no criticism of our senior management in, in doing, uh, in managing the, the, the budget that they are given. Um, our concern, and it's what we were talking about earlier, is about that sort of the snapshot. Um, it, we're looking at what the position is now. What we're saying is that we do not believe um, that with the, 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 the increase in the types of cases, the complexity of cases, um, and with uh, reducing staff budget, which... We, are, we, we would be concerned to see reducing staff numbers for our members. Um, the, the, the consequences um, for that we do not think are sustainable. Well, I think that's a fair point. Uh, Mr Carroll, quickly. Yeah, it was just to come in and say, yes, I, I would agree with uh, Catherine Dyer that, you know, I'm obviously here speaking on behalf of members within Scottish Court Service, so my focus is on uh, the Scottish Court Service uh, budget and, and members, although the justice system... Uh, does work with one another uh, and I was just going to say that you know there is a lot of uh, for example forward planning and organization goes into a uh, court programming for example and again uh, like the FDA uh, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here criticizing uh, my members or the staff of Scottish Court Service or the management of Scottish Court Service for all the planning that does go into managing uh, the caseload that they have against the resources that they have got in terms of uh, staff and obviously the estate and the state of that estate. Um, and uh, from our point of view, you know, having seen the, the budget cuts that came in previously with the 120 staff and then the court closures, but we're going towards a very significant court reforms in the future and probably not the too distant future, which I was uh, hearing that were uh, referred to earlier by members of uh, the Law Society and Victim Support. We certainly do have the same general concerns as the FDA, the Law Society, Victim Support. Um, I see uh, women's aid about the access to justice aspects and the, the pressure of the the complexity of the cases that, that are being done. And as I said, you know, there is that uh, conflict for our staff, and it's probably the same for uh, the Prime Office and Procurator Fiscal staff, where if you're in court, you can't manage the people. And that's on the risk register for Scottish Court Service. Right. 
Uh, can I move on, please? Yes, I mean, I'm conscious of time. I know it's important, but we've a lot to get through. Sandra, followed by Roderick. Thank you very much, Kevin, and, and good morning. Our previous panel, when asked a question in regard of the modernisation or the, you know, the reforms, uh, they did agree they supported the broad principles of the reforms uh, added on to the video links, ICT, etc., etc. Would you consider that you broadly welcome the reforms that's going ahead? I think from a, a, a PCS perspective, we would bro broadly welcome the, the, the reforms that uh, are going ahead, apart from the fact that we still see that there are access to justice uh, issues in terms of the system being able to cope with the cases going through the court. Uh, and for example, um, there is uh, plans in place to reduce the sheriff and jury uh, cases being heard in all sheriff courts to 16 centres, for example. Now, the courts that are quoted earlier, Edinburgh and Paisley, are due to be two of those 16 justice centres, and they have that level of business at the moment. Now, I have to accept that might have been a spike in the business at that particular time, but these courts will have to deal with the cases that are not being heard elsewhere. Um, and with the, the court reforms, we certainly do have a concerns in that regard, although I do accept that Scottish Court Service is planning ahead uh, for that. I would just like to say as well, I heard someone mention about the justice centres earlier. Um, our understanding is that there's possibly three justice centres uh, being considered, and from our information, because um, I heard, the, uh, the, I think it was the, the uh, delegate for the Law Society mentioned that there might be one, for example, planned for the North East. But our information is that there's three planned, one for Inverness, one for Kirkcaldy, and possibly, I think, one for, for Airdrie. Um, and we recognise from the Scottish Court Service evidence that was put in that there's maybe been 60 million of a, a, a budget set aside for that, although Scottish Court Service will have to find money to fund other aspects of that. So, from our point of view, those justice centres, if they're built in those particular locations, they will be replacing a uh, ageing estate, which does need to be replaced and will enhance uh, the service provided for victims, uh, witnesses, jurors, accused, as well as provide better facilities for our staff, hopefully. The FDA has always taken a position that um, we don't take a position on matters of policy generally. Um, certainly we have no um, sort of principled objection uh, to, to, to the plans. Um, the, the focus uh, for the Union has always been on um, the impact and consequences for our, uh, our members um, on any changes. Um, I mean, I, I would make the observation, though, that it, it, it plays into some of the discussions about um, court closures and the discussion we were having earlier about the number of cases um, which are proceeding to a full trial. Um, you know, the underlying picture of um, uh, more cases um, going to, to, to trial, um, if you are reducing the, the number of courts in which those cases can be heard, um, there will be consequences um, and additional pressures uh, for, for the staff who are dealing with those. I think that in terms of the 16 centres, we, we sort of welcome that. We understand that obviously there is a change in this sort of dynamic and Scotland looks a lot different from when the courts that are in place were sort of set up in the sort of 1800s or whatever. Um, and certainly having been in Livingston uh, Court where the High Court sat for the Angus Sinclair trial just last week and looking at the modern sort of technology and the sort of very good facilities for witnesses uh, and uh, the you know, the, the members of the public that wanted to come and see it compared with some of the court estate, which is obviously very old. I can sort of see and understand the attraction for that. From our point of view, we'd be very interested in what it would allow us to do an enhancing service if we had staff that were particularly dealing with sheriff and jury instead of at every sheriff court at the 16 centres. What I would think the public would expect from us would be an increased level of service uh, for victims and witnesses at these sort of locations. So... We will work with uh, Scottish courts as they sort of move to that. But as far as I understand, the, the position is that it's a gradual movement to that. It's not going to be a, a sort of sudden sort of stop. So again, it will be the planning about movement of work. Um, and you know where we do have like the high courts um, and it's sort of dedicated high court facility, then 
the position for victims and witnesses and just members of the public coming into these buildings is a lot better than it is where you're trying to do it in a court that doesn't have the facilities. Chair, could it? I, I'm just trying to move things along a little yeah, bit. You yeah, do know you've got another panel as well. Basically yes. about it's the budget because obviously I wanted to establish short what questions. Thoughts, well. um, yeah. well, I'll try and be short questions. I think we have to welcome the fact that people are reporting more sexual violence, domestic abuse, and with that, obviously, I think you said yourself, Mr. Carroll, it's not the cases; it's the complexity of the cases. So I was wondering if that had a knock-on effect on basically cases concluding. And my final question would be probably for Ms Dyer. Uh, you mentioned it there as well, uh, talking about specialised training, perhaps in certain areas. And would you, you'd mentioned before that you'd moved some of your budget to alleviate, you know, pressures on staff. Would that be something you would look towards when you're talking about specialised training to alleviate the pressures on the staff from court services? Um, if I can maybe start with the... The end bit of that first, I think, yes, in terms of specialisation, I mean, that is one of the things that we moved to, and, and staff, we have staff who are specially trained in domestic abuse, specially trained in sexual offending and stalking, and certainly, again, in, in terms of the quality of it and their understanding of, of what they're to do, I think um, that has definitely increased and is a way of sort of dealing with it, and because that we've moved into that kind of specialisation, it allows us to say we need more staff at, at this particular point. Uh, for, for dealing with things. I think also just the way that things are, are going, technology is going to help us a lot. I think the police, there's a pilot in Aberdeen where the police have been wearing body-worn cameras and for cases such as domestic abuse cases, whatever, most of the compelling evidence can be if you see on the, the night when the police are called out the distress of the victim and perhaps the really continuing bad behaviour of the perpetrator. And there's a lot of discussion around the justice system as a whole, judiciary involved in this as well, of saying that actually we need to move more into the 21st century. If we have things like that, that's a quicker way perhaps of getting evidence that's compelling. And then that would maybe be something, I mean, certainly I think in the Aberdeen experience, if you've got that video, it's pretty hard for the accused to say that, you know, it didn't happen. Whereas if you've got sort of statements that are sort of looked at months after the fact, that's not quite as compelling for people. So I think there's a whole combination of these things where uh, it's generally moving to sort of thinking about how do we present cases? How do we get it to the point where if it is actually the case that somebody should be pleading guilty, they're doing that as quickly as possible? Mm -hmm. I think it's a complexity sure. aspect of it. I would just reiterate mm -hmm. pro pro probably what I referred to earlier right. was the 20 week target. Yeah. What you're saying there mm -hmm. may be reflected in that, in right. that cases being disposed of within that time limit over the piece look as if they're not improving much or they're going down. Mm -hmm. So for cases that are becoming more complex, as was referred to uh, earlier, more cases are going to trial. So therefore, the disposal period is going out. Yeah, it's getting longer. I'm going to Thank have you. to move on, I'm afraid. I'm going to take Roderick's question, yeah. and then I'm going to take... Have you got a question too, Christian? Yeah. Well, I take Roderick's question and John's question and Christian's questions, and if they can't be dealt with collectively, then obviously we'll tease them out. But it's to try and move things along. I'll let you, let you back in. It's simply we've got another panel, yeah. and you'll obviously get supplementaries too if you require it. So yeah. can I have your thank, question, thank you, please? Thank you, Convener. Can I just refer to my membership of interest? as a member of the Faculty of Advocates. I'd just like to focus again on domestic abuse. Uh, and I'm wondering, obviously, in the, the climate in which we now operate, and far more cases coming to trial, whether there is a problem uh, actually at the end of the day with the complainer not actually giving evidence finally, or when she does or give evidence, predominantly she, I would imagine, um, the quality of that evidence being so poor that it's being suggested that court time has been not properly utilised and really is there a it might be helpful to know if there's a line of command in the fiscal service to decide which cases will actually go the full way right, that's fun. Right. and it may not they may not be able to take them all together i just get the questions from us yes john what's yours uh, i have a couple of questions here uh -huh. uh, first one is to mr carroll can i congratulate you mr carroll because it was good to hear that good old trade union saying it's budget cuts you know, rather than uh, uh, efficiency savings. And, uh, but could you perhaps advise me that, obviously, with the budget and, and the way it's progressing, do you anticipate there to be any uh, uh, jobs lost in, 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 in Stingway? And perhaps my other question is to, to uh, Kathleen Dyer. 
it's with regards to, like Margaret Mitchell, I think you're, you're trying to run your service in a false economy. And uh, while she'll been successful this time in receiving additional uh, resource, I think somewhere down the line that the pressure will come to, to, to uh, will come upon on the service. But could you tell me that uh, because of the increased pressures in workload, has there been any serious cases time barred? That's a straightforward question. And Christian, what's yours? Yes, uh, it's, it's on the same line of questioning on uh, uh, sexual offending and domestic abuse and the pressure uh, on, the, on, on the budget. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your, for your, for your input this morning. Uh, <laughs> would you think that uh, uh, with uh, the Siemens pressure, if, if there were not the Siemens pressure on, 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 on the court system, uh, would the, reform, the, the court reform would be a lot more straightforward if we didn't have that? And second of all, uh, is, I think Ms. Dyer talked about it. What do you think for the complexity of these cases, what could we introduce to try to make them simpler and to, uh, to, to have less cost on the, on the budget? I think, I think I'll give Ms. Dyer to answer the three questions which directed about court time, looking about, I think, the prospects, I think it's what you were talking about, in, in the line of command about cases that come forward, particularly with the complainer, and um, also whether reform, repeat that again, reform and the pressures on it, whether that's making it harder for reform to go through? No, I, no I'm just saying if, if you didn't have that yeah. complexity and okay, that okay. increase, you know, with, with the uh, Scottish yeah. Court... And whether any serious cases yeah. were time-barred, therefore didn't proceed. So there's your three. Yeah. And Mr <laughs> Carroll directly on uh, job losses. So... Why do you just answer first? Because I'll be quick. <laughs> <laughs> Please do, yes. Um... We're not expecting any uh, job losses. We work closely with Scottish Court Service Management in that respect. Uh, we have a what we would term a true partnership arrangement within Scottish Court Service. They keep us up to date with uh, anything that is planned in the future, and we do not expect any job losses in the in the future at all. In terms of your budget cuts, yes, efficiencies are doing things smarter, and savings are made. Budget cuts are budget cuts. Now, Ms. Dyer. I, I in relation to people not speaking up at trial, which I think was your, your point of victims yes. of domestic abuse, actually I think the, the reason that happens quite often is because of the dynamic that they find themselves in. Uh, and obviously the position is that we look at the case at the start, as is reported by the police, uh, in co cases where there's a specialist domestic abuse court, there's support from ASSIST and victim support and other organisations which assists people to, to actually get over the nervousness of being speaking out if they've reported to the police and it's coming to court. But certainly it's, it's an area of work where, because of the damage that's really caused to the victims, uh, yes, there is far more, I would say, of the cases where people are reluctant and frightened about what the consequence is going to be for them in the partnership. Now, obviously, we try and address some of that with bail conditions and trying to make sure that people get access. We've got victim information advice where they get access to support. But I just think, again, that indicates, uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody would suggest that we shouldn't take the case up. At the beginning, it looks as if there's going to be enough evidence. Uh, we're learning more about how we can make... The, in the system, victims feel more comfortable so that they have got access to the services that they need support from. Um, but it is a particular feature, I think, of domestic abuse cases um, that a number of them get to court and then there is reluctance uh, from the witness. But we do our best to sort of support and help people give their evidence. It's been suggested to me that there are too many cases which really shouldn't be in court and that the fiscals are limited because there's a line of command in the Crown Office which prevents a decision being taken uh, to uh, desert the case. No, we've got a presumption in favour. That's the yeah. policy that the Lord Advocate has. We've got a presumption in favour. If it looks as if there's enough evidence, we will take it to court because these are serious cases. And I think we see the impact on other areas, you know, health mental health, uh, education in terms of children not doing well out of families like that. So I think it's a sort of societal thing that we've uh, got a policy saying that if there is enough evidence, we'll take it to court. Now, that doesn't always mean, and we all know that going into court, you can come out with a different result than you expected. But I think we've still got a very high conviction rate in this country uh, because of the work that's done by the police. And what's happening is, as Fiona was saying, it's quite often that now we're going back and it's a much more compelling case and people feel the strength that there's two or three of them that they can speak up about what an individual has done to them. In terms of the, sim the simplistic bit, if, if we hadn't had the spike, would this all be going through with a lot less turbulence? I think the answer to that is yes, because obviously the planning was based on 
what it was, but equally well, I think the position is that we are now saying, well, we've got these additional cases, so the planning is now going forward on the basis that we've got the additional cases, and we are asking for additional resource to deal with the additional cases. And in terms of a time bar case, which I think is the other question, a time bar case because of pressure and resource, no. And we really are very clear about that. Our target that we publish is about, if we've got a time bar, we are expecting that we get 100% of the cases dealt with within time bar. So there can be the odd time where somebody has made a mistake, uh, but you know I'm not aware of one of these. And again, I can come back to you with detail of what's happened over the past year, if you would wish. But uh, the answer to that is no. I mean, it's not about letting cases time bar because of resource. We put resource to make sure that cases don't time bar. If I might make one final quick point, just on the staff, uh, on the job losses point, uh, we don't expect there to be any job losses as such within um, our service either apart from the fact that, as we indicated in our written evidence, many of our staff are now um, employed on fixed-term contracts. Um, and so we do expect there to be a reduction in staff um, because the, you know, some of them may not be kept on beyond the end of the fixed-term contracts. Uh, and that's about uh, what we consider to be a budget cut in our staffing budget. <laughs> Can I, can I thank you? I'm sorry it was a bit to what we end, but we've overrun by quite a substantial time. Now, thank you very much for your evidence. Can I say to Roddy and John, put your bid... John, if you pay, you can be in first next time, so you're not cut short. Roddy and John, come in with your questions to the next panel first, because I had to cut... If you have anything you wish we'd asked and we didn't ask, we ought to know, please write and let us know. It would be very helpful. Thank you very much. I suspend for two minutes. We cannot... Welcome our third panel of witnesses, Eric McQueen, Chief Executive, and Cliff Binning, Chief Operations Officer, Scottish Court Service, and Martin McKenna, Acting Deputy Director, Scottish Tribunal Service and Parole Unit, Scottish Government. And that's really because the Scottish Tribunal Service will merge with the Scottish Court Service in April 2015 to form the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. So really, it seemed appropriate to have you all together. I go straight to questions from members. Roddy? John, do you want to be in next? No. You wait a bit. Roddy? Keep, keep, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Could I just start Sandra. by referring to uh, comments reported in the press by uh, Sheriff Little, which uh, was also commented on in the first panel by uh, the representative from the Law Society, um, uh, who correctly pointed out that, obviously, there have been no court closures in the Lothians and Borders to date. Would you, uh, Mr McQueen, just like to clarify uh, your view on Sheriff Little's comments about uh, the position in the Lothians? Yeah, I mean, what I don't want to do is, is comment on the views of an individual sheriff, but I'm quite happy yeah. to comment on the, the position in relation to Edinburgh. Um, and there was actually a statement that I put out to the media on our website just shortly thereafter. Um, and I would say it's a statement that was wholeheartedly agreed by the Sheriff Principal of Lothian Borders. And I think there's a danger here that we, we, we start mixing up court closures. I think some of the discussion that you've heard already um, about some of the challenges that have been experienced with the increase in volumes. We have no doubt whatsoever that Edinburgh has the capacity to comfortably deal with the Edinburgh business. 
Um, we have capacity to deal with more cases than the combined impact of Haddington and Edinburgh. And we are putting in place a court programme that will deal with that business. The Haddington trials that are already being assigned to Edinburgh at the moment, because quite clearly, looking at that cause in, in January, those cases are being signed. Those are being assigned for 16 weeks at the moment. The vast majority of cases in Haddington are being assigned at the moment for 18 weeks, and we expect by the time we come around to the end of January, all cases in sorry in Edinburgh will be assigned for 16 weeks, which is the the optimum period between a plea of not guilty and a trial. Um, so we have absolute confidence that the capacity exists within Edinburgh. Um, the extra resources have been deployed, and as says Catherine Dyer was talking earlier on about resources that have been added to the justice system. Um, a significant part of those resources have come to the Scottish Court Service. So we've been able to employ additional judicial members of staff and additional staff to use the capacity we have to deal with the volumes of business. And we're absolutely confident in terms of Edinburgh, we can deal with the business coming in from Harrington and we can deal with what is deemed to be a reasonable time within the, the justice system. And, and at this stage in the, in the court closure programme, have there been any unanticipated problems? Um, to be honest, no. I mean, it's, it's actually gone surprisingly well. Um, I mean, there were significant concerns being raised about access to justice, witnesses not turning up, intimidation, public order, um, increases in churn in those courts, and, and what we have experienced is, is, is far the reverse from that. Um, if anything, in many courts, it's allowed us to be more flexible in terms of how we use our resource and deploy judiciary and staff to help improve the business coming through. Could you also clarify the position of the Scottish Court Service in relation to uh, feasibility studies for justice centres? It's been also been referred to in the last two panels. Yes. Well, absolutely. I mean, we have been quite clear with the Justice Committee and quite clear in our report on Shaping Scotland's Court Services that we see justice centres as being quite a, a key part of our vision in the future. And certainly, listening to the last group, there's a lot of concern about the quality of the accommodation, about investment, about backlog maintenance. And our view is to actually move to a position of justice centres to try to redress some of that. So we have identified, we did identify in Shaping Scotland's Court Services three areas where we see justice centres as being um, our first priorities. Um, within Inverness, within Kirkcaldy and Fife, and within Airdrie and Lanarkshire. Those are areas that we will work up feasibility studies over the coming months, and we will take our proposals back to government for funding from it. Um, we were delighted to see that in the budget statement we were um, at least earmarked as having access to the additional £60 million that's being created to invest in capital projects um, as being part of a, a justice bid for justice centres. And we believe if we can carry out the feasibility studies, produce the right business cases, then we can take these forward at some period within the next three to five years. We think it's absolutely the right way to go to improve the services, improve the facilities and get the best benefit out of technology in the future. And finally, just in relation to video technology, can you update the committee on how that's going uh, in the courts at the present time? Yeah, I mean, we've had video technology in the court system for some time now. We have video technology in virtually every court across Scotland. Um, we have a, a range of remote sites and what we call ad, ad hoc sites. And quite clearly, as we've recognised, there's been issues with it. Our technology has not been the best. We have occasionally had issues. Um, I know there was some earlier evidence about failures in video links. To be honest, they are the exception rather than the norm, but we did recognise it was an area we had to make big investment in. So we have channelled significant funds in TIC to development both this year and next year. In fact, we've allocated another £1.9 million to ICT next year to bring our standards right up to what we class as being state-of-the-art facilities. So work is currently underway at the moment in terms of putting in the right configuration of system, the new bridges that we'll need to connect to um, our remote sites and arterial lines, and a major upgrade in our video conference will be taking place and will be completed by January. So we expect to be in the position where we will have high-quality, state-of-the-art video conferences and available across Scotland that's reliable, that's consistent, um, and meets the needs and demands that we expect to see increasing through the implementation of the, the, vic the Victims and Witnesses Act. Thank you. Did you say a date when you would have that in place? Yes, we expect to have it in place by the end of January. January next year? This year right. Yes, yeah. I mean, the work's underway at the moment on it already. Thank you. Um, Alison, you've got a supplementary. Yes, Mr McQueen, you just said there that, that some of the concerns that were around at the time of the court closures were, um, on the impact on victims and witnesses um, hadn't come through. Um, you weren't present when Mr McCluskey was given evidence earlier this morning, but he said it was very clear that there was great pressure now um, on, on the facilities that were left 
um, and that victims and witnesses and, and the problems for victims and witnesses were much more acute now in, in the courts that were still open um, and that the pressure of meeting rooms, the lack of separate facilities and things were obviously greatly exacerbated. I wondered what you were doing to review that. Um, well, I think there's a couple of things on that. I mean, one, I think there's something about the language. When we talk about the courts that are left, it sounds like there's very few that's left. Um, actually, the overall movement in business was 5%, so any impact would be 5% on what was already there previously beforehand. Um, we have done a lot of work with Victim Support Scotland and we've worked very much in partnership with them over the last year. Um, going out, visiting our accommodation, looking at the types of facilities we have in place and looking at where we can make improvements. We recognise completely that some of our buildings, we do have some physical limitations. Um, you know, the vast majority of buildings are still Victorian buildings, they're limited in design. We can't just change them overnight. Um, so we do have restrictions in terms of public access in terms of space that's available inside, but we do work very collaboratively with Victim Support Scotland to try to make changes that we can make and we can make quickly to give the best possible service to victims and witnesses. Um, having, having done that work, I mean, it's always um, easy to, to, to work closely, but are you actually flowing through from that? Are you allocating resources in your budget this year to deal Absolutely. with some of and, and I, I would hope that, I didn't hear all the evidence, but I would hope that some of that was reflected by Victim Support Scotland this morning that where we are carrying out the site visits, we are following them up. So we are making changes that can be made. And most of the time, it's not necessarily to do with funding. I think it's more to do with physical restrictions that we actually have within the building. So what we try to do is, is find ways of working around it. How do we make accommodation more flexible? How do we put better signage in place? How do we actually try to use technology to deal with some of these problems? So there's no reluctance on our part to try and make them the improvements. I think it's just about trying to prioritise them and do what we can within what sometimes is a, a restrictive estate. So where, where there are extra resources needed to deal with the issues, um, can you perhaps write to the committee and show us where you're, where you're planning to shift resources to pick that up? Sorry, can I do what? Can you write to the committee perhaps showing us how your budget um, over the forthcoming year is, is allocating resources to do that? Um, I, I've got to say I'm not sure if that would be particularly helpful for the committee. Uh, I'm, I'm just struggling what So you, what you're not shifting benefit. resources into, into improvements to access? Well, I think what we're trying to do is shift resources into the whole set of areas, and that's what we try to set out in terms of early evidence um, about the work that we're currently planning to try to accommodate the Victim Witnesses Act, the investment that we're making in technology, the way we're trying to bring forward and improve the court reforms. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if you're looking at something, something very specific or an individual... An individual court. Can I ask a question? See, when I, I'm actually, I'm not trying to be helpful, it's just I think of Selkirk Shed of Courts, mm. how you would make that accessible to people with disabilities, how you would make it uh, sufficiently separating uh, witnesses for and against in cases. I, I don't know if it's possible, in a, if I'm just, it's the one I know, it's not possible in an old building like that. So what do you do there where you're in a way you're stuck with these Victorian buildings, I'm not talking about Edinburgh, Sheriff Court or the, you know, Livingston, but with these old ones that we still have. Yeah, I mean, what, How what do we, you do it? I think that's well, what, what, what we're trying to do is, is to have minimum standards for all our courts. So minimum standards in terms of accessibility, minimum standards in terms of access to a courtroom. And in the vast majority of our courts, I think it's about 98 or 99%, we can create that access where disabled people can access the building and they can access the courtroom. Um, I think if memory serves me right, there's still one court where that's not possible. And what we do in those cases is we use the accommodation immediately next door for the court if there's a disabled person that requires that access. But I say that's very, very much the case. Um, in the vast majority of courts, we have separate um, witness and defence areas. I'm not sure if there's any courts where we don't have that, actually. Professor? I think that's what you were trying to do. Yeah. To Mr McCluskey this morning about even modern courts, Aberdeen, uh, where the public atrium is a, a choke point, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, think, I, think what so, Alan's, I think what Alan's describing is, is, is not so much the facilities we price. I mean, Aberdeen's a very good example now where we have two separate complexes in Aberdeen. Um, one that deals with the Sheriff Court criminal business and one that deals with the Sheriff Court civil business. So to a certain extent, that's pretty much like our model of the Justice Centre where we're trying to separate off the different strands of building. Within the Sheriff Court in Aberdeen, we absolutely have separate accommodation for Crown and Defence witnesses and complete separation. But like any old building, there's one access to it. 
there's one main reception point, and, and, and we can't change that phys physical configuration. So I think what Alan was more talking about is, that are there more things we can do in terms of signpostage and direction to quickly get people through what you might describe as the communal areas and then moving them off into the separated areas? So it's not that we don't have the physical witness rooms that are separate, but just that there's congestion at times in a public hall and one reception area where there's one access door. And what we can't do is put two access doors I realise I came in in a supplementary. No, if you can come in later. I just okay. look at me there. Elaine, followed by Sandra, please. Yes, uh, Mr McQueen, when you came before us uh, doing courts reform, and then again today, you seem to be very confident that everything is fine, that you're going to be able to cope with all the issues that are in front of you. Uh, you paint a very different picture, and one that is difficult to reconcile with uh, the previous panel, where they were telling us about... Uh, the court service being under stress, about uh, the workforce under pressures of, of workload uh, and indeed uh, Scottish courts' targets in terms of cases coming from first calling to disposal just not being met. Um, well, can you tell us, are there current challenges? Are you actually suffering challenges in the court service at the moment? Do you agree that these may become worse as the new legislation comes through and are you absolutely confident you can meet all these challenges within the current level of resources and offer to you? I, I think, first of all, there's absolutely no doubt that we, we have challenges. I mean, I think any organisation working within the, the public sector with the expectation of reform and the financial constraints we're working on are challenging, and, you know, that, and that's something we are, we're absolutely open about. Um, I think there's two slightly different issues there, which maybe if I can just address separately. One about the business volumes, I think the targets, as you described, and then one about the perception of the staff, and I think it's maybe helpful if I just separate those out. Um, in terms of the business volumes, and again, from hearing a bit of the evidence, I think um, Catherine Dyer had moved something into this, that we have experienced a change in demand over the course of the last 12 or 18 months. So there has been a, an upsurge in terms of domestic abuse, and there has been an upsurge in terms of particularly sexual crimes. Um, from our point of view, that was very much unplanned and unforeseen, um, but something that we can cope with in the flexibility we have within the system. We're a demand-driven organisation, and when the demand changes, we move to change our approach. So we've had extensive discussion with the Justice Board for Scotland in terms of the level of demand, how long we expect that to continue for, and resources have been reallocated within the justice system and have now been deployed and are now bringing the waiting periods for trials back to where we would expect to see. So we are very confident that it's moving to the early next part of next year. Then the vast majority of courts will be either at or as close as reasonable to the, the 16 weeks, which is an acceptable period for trial diets. So it's not that we're have, not having challenges, but I think we've develop, develop, developed them in a very collaborative way. And I think we've put in place very good measures um, for actually how we contain them and move us back into the position that we want to be in. Um, on the, the staffing side, and I think it's quite interesting, um, Again, for all staff in any organisation at the moment, there are lots of pressures, there are lots of challenges. Um, what I didn't re necessarily recognise was, was, was the exact feedback that, that Brian Carroll, our, our trade union representative, gave us. Um, just as recently as last week, we got the results back from our, our people survey that we carry out annually. Um, it's a survey that's carried out um, by Cabinet Office. Um, it's absolutely independent and it's carried out across every government organisation across the UK. Um, we got the high-level figures for the staff survey, and this was completed by staff during October, so it is incredibly recent. And some of the results here, from my perspective, are actually pretty impressive. Um, we have a, an overall engagement score, um, and that doesn't mean a, a heck of a lot, of 64%, um, which is in one of the top levels within the whole of the UK civil service. Um, so in terms of, of sectors, we're right at the very top of there. 92% um, of staff fully understand the organisational objectives and purposes. 82% of staff are comfortable with their workload levels and the resources that they have available to them. Our staff have scored very highly in terms of how we manage change in the organisation and scored very highly in terms of their own learning and developing career opportunities. In all of those segments, we're at the top scores within the civil service. So I these have not seen that paper. Is it a public paper? Um, we'll be putting it public probably in about the next week or so. so well, be, I think it would be useful, now that you're website. reading for it, to put in the public... 
more quickly so that we have it um, when we are considering our report well, so, to the Finance yeah. Committee, if that could be put. Yep, we're sure I, reading from it now, but you know, we are at a disadvantage. No, I say these results are only just out. So I mean, I'm, I'm giving No, them, I appreciate that. Yeah. I don't think there's any jiggery-pokery. No, no, I just so think, now the, you've done it, if we could have it, we can put it on our website and it would be a public document. Absolutely, yeah, because I, mean, I think it's a very right. good reflection of our staff and what has been a, a difficult and trying time. The one thing I would say is there was a comment also made about the fact that people in pressure issues are on a risk register. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think we'd be um, incompetent if it wasn't on a risk register. Um, to say things that are on a risk register doesn't mean to say they're necessarily a problem, but we're recognising that they could be risks. So technology is on a risk register, people is on a risk register, our capacity for change and change management is on a risk register to make sure that we're aware of them, that we're taking the appropriate actions, and we're trying to mitigate them as far as possible. Um, I would find it quite a scary position as Chief Executive if I was saying that people issues and change issues were not on my risk register. So I, th I think that's a, a very positive thing rather than a negative thing. Mm. Maybe I don't know whether you heard the, the evidence from the FDA, if you know, ED from FDA. About, I didn't hear a lot of it, no. Uh, uh, you know, of a survey they'd done, or, or the FDA had done on, on, on staff, indicated significant stress levels among staff, particularly concerns around preparation times and these sorts of things. Which are, mm. Mm. Within the, the, within the Crown Office? Yeah, within the Crown Office, yeah. obviously within the Crown Office, but, but Mr Carroll was saying similar, there were similar stresses within yeah. his sector. Yeah, I, I say I can only... We're not expecting you mm. to answer the Crown mm. Office. No, no. I can only feed back to you what mm. our, our staff have told us last month. Which we will have mm. in public yeah. by Which we tomorrow. Have in public, yeah. Right. Mm. And the one thing I would say to that is that we do actually spend a lot of time discussing this with our staff. Um, so we have been round over the course of the summer speaking to every member of staff about the change, about the reforms, Fantastic. about the business yeah. volumes and about how we're planning on dealing with them. Um, so it's certainly not something that's come as a surprise to any of our staff. Because also the figures that Mr Carroll gave us in terms of the, the targets, some of the courts were well off target, well off target at the moment. I mean, do you think that's just because of the stress of certain types of cases coming through just it's now? It's primarily because of the increase in cases we had through. And I say already what we're starting to see is those figures are coming down um, quite quickly as the recovery programmes are going in place. And we expect, I say, by the early part of next year, for the vast majority of courts, we will be pretty much back as close as we can expect to be within the 16 weeks as being that optimum period between a not guilty plea and a trial down. I'm just going to ask that the Scottish Tribunal Service staff, they, they'll become part of the staffing of the Scottish Court Service. Would you like to perhaps say something, Mr McKenna, about them? Sure. Uh, well, it's quite pleasing, actually. We just can uh, finished a similar survey, as Eric was saying, it's across the our government departments. And they're also, it would seem we've gone up in terms of our scores and that, so our staff seem to be well engaged and well aware of the, you know, the, the, uh, of the, uh, the, the impending merger. Uh, all, all aspects of the merger are actually going well at the moment. You know, we're quite comfortable that, uh, that this is a good thing for us to be doing. Our staff are uh, just next week, actually, we, we kick off with a series of roadshows to engage with our staff. And we've got Scottish Court Service uh, HR people coming out as well. So we're doing a bit of a, a joined up event with the managers and tribunal service and court service and HR people to to speak to and support our staff through into the new merged organisation. So, so I think we're putting a lot of time and effort into helping our staff, if you like, into the new organisation. And I think when they get there, the, uh, the types of opportunities that will be there for them, I think, will be better, perhaps, than the ones they have at the moment within Scottish Government. It's, it's a better fit for them, I think, in terms of their operational background. Um, I'll come back. Let other come back to staff. Just sure. in there. Uh, did that you? Sandra, followed by Alison, please. Uh, thank you for being, um, uh, to that. No, Alison. Anyway. Anyway. I just wanted to pick up uh, on a number of issues that perhaps uh, previous members had mentioned also, and uh, Brian Carroll had also mentioned uh, in the fact of, yes, we have seen un unprecedented rise in reports of domestic violence and rape and uh, sexual abuse. That can only be a good thing. But when we were asking about the timescale, and I think uh, Elaine had raised this as well, a timescale of cases concluding, uh, Mr Carroll himself said that it wasn't so much the cases, but it was the complexity of the cases. Uh, do you think we perhaps should be a wee bit more flexible in this particular one about the, after all, surely it's access to justice and not just 16 weeks that has to be carried through. Perhaps there should be, I'm not saying you can name the cases, perhaps there should be asterisks in the fact that certain cases are very complex and will take longer than 16 weeks. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, I think that's a very valid point, and I think it's something that's, that's worthy of consideration. Um, I mean, one of the, the main drives, particularly in terms of domestic abuse, um, has certainly been through both a combination of the specialist courts and the toolkit that's in place about trying to actually cluster cases and to try to bring them to court at, at an earlier stage. Um, to be honest, my own personal view is that, that actually there's still a lot of strength in that argument. Mm. Um, I think in terms of domestic abuse, the quicker we can get to a, a position where evidence is given, um, I think there's probably a, a greater probability um, of that p p case proceeding and concluding. So I think in terms of domestic abuse, I would certainly encourage any sort of input and resources to try to make sure that domestic abuse is dealt with within a, a short and time scales. One of the difficulties that we have with domestic abuse now, and again, it's because of the, the surge in the recent levels, um, is that domestic abuse accounts for about a third of the cases um, that are coming through the Sheriff Court. So it makes it very, very difficult when you've got that volume of cases about how do you apply a fast-track, specialised approach to something that is at such a significant level. So you know, I think there's probably some thought and consideration that, that is being given and will need to be given in terms of is there some way that you can prioritise within that? So how do you identify, as you say, maybe asterisks up some of the most complex, some of the most difficult, and you know, when I say serious, I don't mean that there's less serious cases, but I think you get my message about how we can actually try to deal with those at a quicker space. Um, I think in terms of some of the more serious cases, and particularly the sexual cases where there is very intensive investigations, then, then arguably maybe right in some of those cases, actually a longer time scale would help those be properly prepared and brought through into court. So I, I think it's a bit of horses for courses for the, the type of case and the level of complexity. Just two quick questions, Chair, because it's coming from the Women's Aid Submission. Mm. Uh, just a quick point of clarification. You mentioned in regards to the IT system. I think you answered the Chair by saying it will be up and running by January 2015, because yeah. this is one of the, the concerns they raised in that. Yeah. So that's definitely, it'll be definitely, you know, they raised the fact yeah. that I mean, we're, we're making some, I, mean, I don't know if you want to, be, to talk about IT, I mean, we're, we're doing some significant investment and upgrade to our IT systems generally, way beyond just video conferencing. Um, and, and I don't know if it's helpful at all just to, just to touch on it at this particular case, or do you want to just stick purely yes, to the questions? Yeah, I think we'd like to know a little as it's yeah, very important to expediting yeah. cases and yeah. assisting with victims mm -hmm. and witnesses. Yes. Yeah, I mean, just to give you a quick overview, I mean, I mean there's, a, there's a number of things that we are working on this year, and some of them will carry into next year, and this is about the, the additional investment over the course of these two years. Um, first of all, our big main priority has been putting in a, a new state-of-the-art infrastructure. So what's described as a wide area network connections between every court, given speeds of up to 100 megabit per second, are now in the process of being installed. So that will be a high-speed access across all of our courts across Scotland, um, and that should be in place by the end of this year. We had done it at the same time with that, as I was saying earlier, extensive work in terms of upgrading our, um, our video link capacity, and that will be in place by January time. Um, at the same time, we have brought in an electronic case management sort of handling system for video conferencing bookings. So rather than things being done manually because we expect there's going to be more bookings, we'll have an automatic system that staff can use to book video slots so we can make sure we've got resilience, that the expertise is there and that lines are working. We'll have a much better way of, of managing things. During the course of between December and through to probably about September, October next year, we will be upgrading all what's called the local area networks within individual courts, which means that they can then take real advantage of the high-speed capability. And importantly, that will allow us to provide wireless access. Sorry, in that very quickly. So you're increasing high-speed capability, but all courts can't be able to do that till a period of time during next year up to September. No, no, there's, there's, there's two, like all of these things, there's different parts of it. One, there's the infrastructure in terms of the wider network, yep, and that's the one that's yes. being installed now. We also have a rollout programme upgrading our internal capability within courts, yep, and yes. that will allow us to provide wireless access. So we'll have wireless access in courts by September or right, October next year. Yeah. Some of it will come in earlier, some of it will be delivered no, by September October time. So by the time we move to next September, we'll have wireless access in all our courts and we'll have all the high-speed connections in place and a, and a very new infrastructure. 
The other big major development we're making, this is one of the big areas of expenditure next year, is introducing what we describe as our new generation of case management systems. Um, so we're currently out to procurement at the moment, and that's almost finalised. Um, business case will be going to the SAS board for sign-off in December, and we expect to lay in the contract in January. And this will be our new case management system, initially for civil business, um, that will be about full electronic access, electronic registration, case management, online production of documents, and online presentation of evidence. And this is our first big step about significantly moving paper um, out of the system. And that is due to be delivered by October 6, 2016. Yeah. Um, Thank you. John Pentland, please, John. Mr McQueen, I think uh, last year I asked a, a similar question to that which Elaine Murray asked you there that you, you know you give the you know you give this uh, impression that everything's good within your service. And uh, but then I find out that when I'm reading your report that you know some months into the into the the, uh, the financial year you're asking for an additional two and a half million pounds to help you deliver that service, you know, through uh, uh, 1 million, 1 1.2 to cover the transitional costs for courts and tribunals of service, and then there was an additional million pound to provide staff. So I'm just, you know, the question is just how reassured can you, uh, what assurance can you give the committee that, you know, your budget this year, you won't be coming along mid-term and asking for, for additional money. Uh, the second one is, is with regards to earlier, and I think it was a question again to either Roderick or, or, or to Sandra that you... Uh, move resources uh, to to where they're, they're needing demand. So, where do these resources then come from if, if you're allocating them to something else that needs that demand? And does that then tell me, and again, tell me if I'm wrong, that, that you may have some sort of uh, contingency within your budget that allows you to do that type of thing? Okay. And I think the third one is that with regards to your budget, uh, what is your efficiency target every year for savings? And I'm using efficiency eh, eh, this time, budget. rather than budget cuts, because you're not getting down to the, you know, losing jobs yet. So what's your efficiency target? OK, on your, your, your first question about the £2.5 million in a year, um, half of that was well planned. Um, so in terms of the bill that came forward for the, the, the merger of the tribunals, um, then the planning for the transitional cost has been in place for some 12, 18 months. So when the SES board agreed to move to the merger with the tribunal service last November, that agreement was already in place with the Scottish Government that to facilitate there was a £1.2 million worth of transitional cost to allow that to happen. So that was agreed and in place in um, November, December, um, sorry, October, November last year. And it just took until this year before the budget transfer was was affected into place. So that that part of it was clearly planned. The the other issue about the other part of the money, which was the million pound in terms of dealing with the increased business volumes, was something that was taken forward through the Justice Board. So this is where there was difficult discussions taking place um, about the change in business volumes, about the change in complexity, and about the need to move resources to deal with it. So a decision was taken within Justice to allocate additional money to both the Crown Office and the Scottish Court Service to deal with his increased business volumes that we've seen during the last 12 months. So that was pretty much the rationale in terms of where that extra two and a half million came from. Um, in terms of our budgets for next year, are we um, assured that they're comfortable and, and, and do we think we're going to go for any more, any more increases? At, at the moment, absolutely yes. I mean, the, the one caveat which I'll come back to is, is the increased business volumes. Um, at the moment, we are confident that our budget is set at the right level. It will allow us to deliver. Um, you know, as any chief executive, nobody would ever turn away additional funding if it was the opportunity. Um, but also, we've got to balance it with a, a realism of the pressures that exist on public sector funding. Yep, so we've got to make sure that we've got plans in place that are affordable and that are deliverable. And we are absolutely confident that is the case. Um, with the increase in business volumes, we have saw, or seen anyway, positive signs that some of those are starting to come back. So Sheriff Court business volumes are down about 4% already this year. That's looking to carry on. And with movements that have been making in terms of justice of the peace cases, again, we're expecting to see the business volumes start to come back down. 
if we end up in the position where in the middle of next year and we're finding that there's been a change or there's something else, else happened in terms of demand, then that's a discussion again we would need to have with the Justice Board and with the Scottish Government. Yep. So that's something that will always be under discussion and will always be fluid about how we identify our resources. In, in terms of efficiency targets, I mean, one of the things that we don't set is, a, is an absolute efficiency target. I'm not a great fan of setting targets for the sake of set, setting targets. But what we have got is a three-year strategy in place for the organisation about how we remain financially stable. So we put this in place initially about two years ago as part of our thinking about actually how to reduce initially the cost base of the organisation, where there was difficult decisions taken, and that included issues about court structures, to make sure that we had funding at the right level that would allow us to invest in our buildings and allow us to invest in our technology and allow us to deliver the court reforms. And that's exactly what our corporate plan has set out for the next three years to achieve, and that's exactly what we're going to deliver next year as the first part of that corporate plan. So this has been about long-term planning to make sure that the justice reforms are affordable and that we can deliver on them. But I understand then that you know that you will have a responsibility to be making some sort of efficient saving percentage. Is there, is there, is there an efficient? Is there a, a, a minimum percentage saving that you would make? And is there a maximum? Absolutely not. I mean, I, I, I thought I had covered that already. I see, I, 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 we don't set a target for efficiency savings. What we've set out is a long-term plan for the organisation of how we're going to deliver the change and how we're going to deliver the forums and make sure that we have the budget of part of that to achieve it. That's what's in our corporate plan. That's what's in our business plan right. for next year. And, and, and that's what we'll deliver. So as a service, uh, you don't have any responsibility to meeting any efficiency saving? within your organisation? No, I think what I'm saying is that I don't have a target yet. So, so I don't set the organisation a, a target of 10% and, and go off and just save it in whatever way you can. What we've got is a very careful and a very worked out plan for the next three years. Part of that is about driving efficiency as we move toward technical delivery. Yeah, one of our key things is about actually making sure we do digital by design. So there's a whole range of areas which, again, if you want me to talk about, I'm quite happy to talk about, about where we're delivering efficiencies within the organisation by using technology. So to me, I'd much rather it was a part of our plan and it was a part of our thinking rather than employing arbitrary targets on the organisation to achieve 3% or, or 4%. So just for my understanding, I'm quite sure maybe the rest of the committee will understand what you're saying, but just for my understanding, uh, that during the reform of the court services, uh, where there was an identified amount had to be had to be made through efficiency, you don't have any responsibility of meeting that efficiency. So, in effect, could you not deliver any efficiency savings whatsoever? Um, I, I've got absolute responsibility as a accountable officer for the funding, the efficiency and the delivery of the Scottish Court Service. And what I put in place plans over the next three years is to deliver those reforms and deliver the efficiencies which are built in part of it. If you're saying to me, do I have a target that I impose on the organisation of X percent, then, then no, I don't. And, I, and again, I think that's a positive thing. Just one other question again, it's just for, for information. It says, I'm just again looking at your submission and it was uh, paragraph 13. The majority of the SES annual running costs are met by voted funds. Could you maybe explain voted funds to me? Um, that's funds that are allocated from the Scottish Government as part of the budget bill. Yep, so the budget bill allocates funds to the Scottish Court Service and we receive other income through retention of um, certain elements of criminal fines that are imposed in courts for civil fees that are recovered through our courts and for a much smaller amount of other income that we generate through leases and rental costs on our, our properties. Again, is it just, uh, you know, you don't put your hands up to say, I vote for X, Y or Z. It's, is this just a, a kind of word that's thrown in there that kind of gives me the impression that you do put your hands up whether you agree to voted funds or not? Sorry, I'm sort of confused. I think it's, a, we're going uh, okay? yeah, it's uh, voted funds is a is a technical term to reflect. The Hopefully, Mr. No, Binning, you're no, not sorry, I'm just. Is it not what the Parliament so agrees? No. Yeah. Yeah. But perhaps, Mr. Binning, you'll explain to us, and then we can move on. Yeah, voted funds. It's a it's a technical term to reflect the fact that the awards of funds are funds voted for by Parliament yeah. and approved by Parliament. As a 
as opposed to other other income sources. So it doesn't imply there is a, a a kind of election or voting kind of process. It's part of the parliamentary budget process. Good. Fully understand that now, Mr. Banning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, smelt a rat there. No words, no rat, at least there. <laughs> thank you very much, John, and thank you very much for your evidence. We now move into private session.